Well, both juries are present. All defendants are both defendants are present, and all counsel as well. And to everyone, good morning. Good morning. And we're ready to resume with the uh, testimony, direct testimony of the defendant Eric Menendez. Would you state your name again for the record, please? Eric Galen Menendez. All right. I'll remind you, you're still under oath. You may resume your direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Menendez, when we left off yesterday, we were talking about Saturday night. August 19th, 1989. You recall that um, after the argument with your mother, you and your brother went outside and had another talk. You recall that? Yes. And what did you do after the talk with your brother? I went upstairs to my room. And did you take the gun with you or did you leave it? No, I took the gun. And had you done anything to change any the, the two rounds that you had previously put in the gun? No. And when you got up to your room, you put the gun down where? On the side of my bed. And you showed us on the photograph yesterday where that was? Yes. And then what did you do after you had put the gun down? I just waited. I waited around my desk. I was looking out the window toward the guest house. Why? Just because looking at Lyle gave me a lot of comfort. So I just wanted to see what he was doing. And do you have any idea how late it was at this point? 1.30 in the morning, maybe 2. And were you, uh, did you think you were in a condition at that point to go to sleep? No. no. And why was that, that you didn't think you could go to sleep? I was real nervous. I was real uh, uh, tense. I just, I was real scared and I didn't, I just couldn't get to sleep. My nerves were fried. Had you gotten undressed? Had you prepared to go to sleep? No. And at some point after you were in your room for a while, did you hear something or someone approaching? Yes. And what sounds did you hear? Just footsteps coming toward my uh, room. And had you locked the door to your room as you previously testified you usually did? Yes. Oh, yes, I locked the room. And did you have any uh, indication from the sound of whose footsteps they were? I, I didn't know for sure, but I was hoping it wasn't Dad. I was wrong. You were hope you'd rather it were Mom? <coughs> yeah. And after the footsteps, did you hear something else? Yeah, my dad started pounding on my door and telling me to open the goddamn door. And from the voice, you knew it was Dad and not Mom? Yeah. Overruled as to the question, but let's not refer to them as your dad and Mom. They're his father and mother, so let's refer them in that context. Do you refer to your parents? How do you refer to your parents when you talk about them? Uh, dad and mom. So could you tell who the person was on the other side of the door? Uh, yes, I um, was dad. Okay. And what did your father say? Uh, he was pounding on the door and telling me to, he was pounding on the door and uh, with his fist, I, I guess, and uh, telling me to open the goddamn door. You have to stay back a little bit. You're popping the mic. Why don't you try to put your back against the back of the chair and keep it there if you could. Okay? All right. And what was your reaction? What did you do, if anything, after you heard your father say, open the door? I ran toward my gun and grabbed it. Okay. You had been somewhere else in the room? Yeah, I was, I was sort of sitting on the desk looking out the window, and uh, the gun was around around the side of the desk uh, underneath the bed and so I just ran around and grabbed the gun. And what did you do after you grabbed the gun? I sat on my bed with my gun right across. Excuse me. Photograph, if I may approach you. Do you yeah. have a photograph in front of you? Yes. yes. My bedroom. And uh, does this particular photograph show your bed? Yes. And um, this photograph shows a lot of stuff on your bed. Yes. And was all that stuff on your bed that Saturday night? No. And you said you sat on your bed with the gun? Yes. Would you circle the area in that photograph where you sat on the bed? And from that place, 
from the foot of your bed where you've circled, um, in what direction is the door that leads into your bedroom? It's directly across from it, a little to the left. So it's opposite the foot of the bed and a little to the left? Yes. And what was your emotional state with your father banging on the door and demanding that you open it? I was I was so scared. I didn't I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought my dad was going to break down the door. I certainly wasn't opening the door, and I was just holding the gun across my lap, shaking, and I didn't know what was going to happen. You didn't unlock the door on this occasion. No. And why was that? Why didn't you unlock the door on this occasion? Because I was afraid I wasn't going to let my dad in again. I didn't. I, he hadn't talked to me all weekend, and now he was suddenly uh, pounding on my door and yelling, and I was I was scared. I didn't know what was going to happen. Did the conversation and the argument that you had had with your mother earlier that evening have anything to do with your not being willing to open the door? Objection to the Sustained. Was there anything that had happened earlier that evening that contributed to your unwillingness to open the door or to the way you were feeling, or both? To the way I was feeling, um, uh, more than not. But uh, yes, it was partly the what Mom said to me and partly just how my dad was yelling and pounding on the door and the fact that Lyle was all the way across in the guest house. Okay, did you, um, how long did this go on? with your father pounding and yelling? Maybe a minute. And what was going through your mind during that minute? What was going through my mind was he was going to break down the door. And what were you going to do? Did, were you thinking, what would you do? Yeah. If, if, oh. Wait for the question, please. <coughs> if he broke down the door? I was going to shoot. I was just going to shoot. And did you think you would be able to do that? I really didn't think I'd be able to. Why not? I was, I was just frozen. I was, I was shaking, and, and I knew what he was going to do. Or at least I thought he was going to break down the door. And I was saying, I got to shoot him. I got to shoot him. And I, I remembered I only had two uh, shells in my gun. And I was saying, oh my God, I'm going to die. Uh, because if I miss him or if I hit him, mom's still in the house. Lyle's all the way in the guest house. And I, I, didn't, know, I, didn't, I didn't know what was going to happen. And were you, you, you also said just now that you didn't know that you would be able to shoot him. Did you think if the door had flung open and your father was standing there, what did you think you would or wouldn't do? I was, I, I don't know, I was frozen. I don't know what was, I was going to do. Did you in fact do anything but sit on the bed holding the gun? No, I couldn't move. And eventually, did your father stop pounding on the door? Yes. And did he say anything uh, when he stopped? He said that I was going to have to come out of that room tomorrow. I'm sorry. He said I was going to have to come out of that room tomorrow. And did he then, did you hear footsteps or did, did he leave or what? He left. I don't remember if I heard the footsteps or not. But I didn't, uh, I didn't know where he was, what he was doing. And what did you do after that? I just sat on the bed um, for, a, for a little while and then looked out toward the guest house to see if I could sort of wave Lyle down, but I couldn't, and uh, I wasn't leaving that room, so I just let me, waited. Let me ask you something. You heard Detective Zoller testifying yesterday that uh, your room, the windows in your room, don't open to the guest house. Do you remember him saying that? Yes. Is he right or wrong? No, he's wrong. In fact, your room has windows on two sides, or had windows yeah, on two sides. Both sides of the uh, desk, one right across from the bed and one right before the bathroom. And that's on, and looking in that photograph, Mr. Menendez, in what direction are the windows? To the left, to the right, or straight ahead? To the, le to the left. And both of those windows face what direction? The guest house. They face east, <clears throat> like towards Maple Drive? Yes. And the back of your room, behind the bed, for example, that wall, does that wall face south? I guess that would be south. Is there a window on that wall also, the one behind your bed? Yeah, but it's covered by the bed. It's a long, tall window, and it's covered by the bed. So there's windows on two different walls of the room? Yes.
When you were sitting on the bed and your father was outside the door, did you have any thoughts about whether or not um, two rounds of ammunition could or couldn't kill someone? I didn't think it'd be able to kill my dad, but even if it did, I knew my mom had a gun in her room and uh, in her closet, and, and I thought maybe I'd have to jump out the window. All these thoughts were going through my mind. How did you know your mother had a gun? Because she bought the gun the year before. Did you think there was one gun in the house, or did you think there were more than one gun in the house? No, there were two rifles and a, uh, I believe it was a pellet gun, but I knew there were two rifles. You popped a pellet gun, you said? There was a, a separate, a third gun, I thought, um, that was a pellet gun. And but was that a long gun, like a BB rifle, or was it a, a pistol-type pellet gun? No, it was a long gun. <coughs> now, with respect to one of these rifles, you say that you knew that your mother had purchased it a year before? Yes. And how did you know she bought a gun a year before? Because I was with her. And where did she buy it? In Woodland Hills at a, it's right across the street from the Topanga Mall. Uh, I think at the time it was called Sports Mart or something like that. Okay. And how did you come to be with her when she was purchasing a gun? I don't remember how I came to be with her. We were in her um, Mercedes. Uh, she had a convertible. And uh, she said I had to get something or something like that. And we went into the Sports Mart. And I sort of just wandering around because all the sports things. And uh, she bought the gun. She came out with it. And she ca you met up with her again outside the store? I don't remember uh, where I met, if I met up with her before, but I remember walking toward the car and asking her what was that because she had a long box and she opened it up before she got in the trunk. And she showed you? Yes. And did you, uh, and it appeared to be what? What was in the box? It was a, uh, a wooden, partly engraved, uh, brown and black uh, gun, long rifle. And did you ask her anything about it? Yeah, I asked her, why did you buy that? And what did she say? She said, I'm going to kill somebody. Actually, she said, I'm going to kill someone. Someone. And did you uh, ask her who? No. I, I had some ideas, though. Did you ask her why? No, I didn't ask her a single question after that. She just put it in the trunk. Well, why wouldn't you ask your mother, or why didn't you ask your mother who she was going to kill or why she had bought a gun? Because... Well, the question is, why would he or did he ask the question? So at this point, it's not hearsay. It just goes no. to a state of mind and it's not I'll anything else. To withdraw the question, okay. but do you, right, you're with your mother, she's bought a gun, she says she's going to kill someone, is that right? Yes. Is your family the kind of family where you ask each other a lot of questions, communicate a lot? No, you don't ask each other a lot of questions, especially, especially with my mom, um, the way she was. Uh, she was doing a lot of strange things, and um, at the time, she was really taking her medication heavily. She was taking like 13, 15 pills a day. She was disappearing a lot, and she was going into a lot of her rages often, suddenly. And I didn't, I was, I was afraid of her. I mean, afraid of her outbursts and so on, and, and the fact that she wasn't completely um, stable and so on. So I, I thought I knew why she bought the gun. Well, did you think she bought it to kill herself, to kill your father, to kill you? What? To kill a stranger? To kill <coughs> birds? What? I, I... All right, it just uh, will reflect the witness's state of mind, and for no other reason, uh, you may answer the question, what was your state of mind? Okay, she, did, she didn't tell me why. Um, what I thought was that she was either going to kill Louise or one of my dad's other girlfriends, or she was going to kill dad. I was hoping the latter. Yeah, you were hoping the latter for your sake, for her sake? For, for my sake, sake. Um, so the sex would end. Now, do you remember the date of this purchase of, um, of the rifle by your mother? I know it was the summer before. I don't remember the date. Do you think it would refresh your recollection if I showed you the receipt for the purchase of the gun? Yes. Yes. 
First of all, Mr. Menendez, let me call your attention to the signature on the bottom of this page. Do you recognize the handwriting? Yes, it's my mom's handwriting. And do you uh, recognize this as a receipt for the purchase of a 22 caliber rifle or 22 caliber gun? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was just looking at what the store was. It just says Best Products, Northridge, California. Is that right? Yeah, that wasn't where, though. I can't bought. hear you. Oh, that wasn't where it was bought. I don't know why the receipt says that. But. It wasn't the name of the store, but that's the, that's the imprint on the Judge receipt. Lee. Sustain. Okay. You don't remember the name of the store being Best Products? You no, it wasn't Best Products. I don't, I don't believe. I thought it was Sports Smart. It was right across from the Topanga Mall. Okay. Does this appear to be a receipt from the summer of 1989 for the purchase of a rifle by your mother? Yes. And what's the date on the receipt? Can you read it? The month is in the middle. Uh, 88, uh, 62988. June 29, 1988. Yes. And is, does that refresh your recollection as to when it was that you were with your mother at a store where she bought a rifle? Yes. Now, returning to that Saturday night, you said your thought was that even if you could unfreeze enough to shoot the two rounds, that you thought your mother might be right there with the gun that she had bought. Yes. Well, I didn't think she was right behind the door, but I thought she'd, she'd get her gun. Now, did you telephone your brother to tell him what had happened? No. Why not? Because I didn't want my parents to know that I was calling my brother. And if the phone had rung at that hour of the night, what do you think your parents would have done? Oh, they would have picked it up. Did you ever get to sleep that Saturday night? Yes. And when you went to sleep, approximately what time was it? I'm not sure, maybe 4.30. I was exhausted and I just fell asleep with my clothes on in the bed. I don't, didn't look at the clock. And do you recall getting up again later that morning? Yes. Do you have any idea what time it was that you got up? Mm. I woke up out of my nightmare and I just woke up and I saw that it was daylight so I just, um, I don't remember if I took a shower, I'm, I'm not sure. I just went over to Lala's guest house. Do you know what time you woke up, yes or no? No, I don't. Okay, but after you woke up, um, first of all, before you went to Lyle's guest house, did you determine whether or not your parents were awake or still in their room or what? I listened at the door um, to see if they were outside and I figured they probably were not outside of it. So I opened it up and uh, I mean, I can see my parents' windows, but I can't see their bed from my room. I can only see if the lights on or off. And uh, I thought they were probably still inside. Did you hear any sounds that told you they were outside the bedroom? No. So did you leave the house? Yes. <clears throat> and did you take the gun with you or did you leave it in your bedroom? I put it in my closet. And did you hide it in some way or conceal it in some way? Yes. And then you went to the guest house and did you see your brother there? Uh, yes. He opened up the door. And uh, did you tell him about the night before? Yes. About what had happened in your room? Yeah, I told him what happened with that. And did you then leave the house? Yes. And did you have any kind of uh, understanding with your brother about your coming back at any point during the course of the day? Yeah, I had um, told him, I believe, uh, that I would come back around noon or somewhere around there. And what was the purpose of your coming back at noon or somewhere around there? Partly because Lyle just didn't want to be in the house all day alone. Um, uh, not knowing what my parents were going to do, and partly because I was so worried, I, I wanted to know if they had talked. Now, what was the purpose of your brother staying there that day versus you leaving? So that, that so one, so we wouldn't be together, and the other, so that Lyle would be able to stay home and, uh, and sort of hang around my parents to see if 
to see to see any signs to see what they um, what kind of mood they were in what they whether he thought they were still going to kill us or whether they were just angry or whether they actually wanted to talk just sort of get a feel and hopefully start a conversation and uh, as of that Sunday morning was that a, a sunny day it was a sunny day I wasn't very hopeful that anything was going to happen though were you fearful that morning, or were, was it like another sunny day and you didn't want to think about it? No, I was, I was fearful. I mean, from Saturday night, that was the idea for Lyle to, to stay home and see if Mom and Dad would talk. But <coughs> after what happened the night before, I just wanted to get out of the house, and I didn't think that Dad was going to be in too good of a mood. So you didn't think anything? Had, had, did, you, did you consider whether or not anything had improved in the family? No, I thought things were getting worse. And from, let me go back with you for a moment. From Tuesday night, when you first uh, revealed things to your brother, until Thursday night when your father attacked you, between those two days, uh, what was your general <coughs> emotional state? Before you knew that Dad had been threatened, before Dad came after you, what was your general well, Again, let's refer to I'm him sorry. as his father and not yours. Right. No, it certainly wasn't mine. Okay, then rephrase the question. What was your emotional state between Tuesday night and Thursday before you were confronted by your father in your bedroom? I was just real anxious about what the conversation between, um, I mean, before Thursday I got home. Uh, before Thursday you got home, yes. Yeah, I was just real anxious about what Lyle's conversation with Dad was going to, how it was going to turn out. I was sort of praying it would turn out well. Um, and uh, worrying that it wasn't. So you were worried and anxious, is that a fair statement? Yes. Now, after Thursday, after the confrontation with your father in your bedroom, did your emotional state change? After Thursday, yes. Okay. And how would you describe, and, and did that emotional state continue throughout from Thursday to Sunday? You mean the fear? It sort Is of that went what up. your emotional state was? Was it fear? Yes. And was there any point from Thursday night until Sunday when you're leaving the house when you were not frightened? No. Now, did the level of fear remain the same at all times during those few days, or did it change, or what? No, it changed. At times, it, it, it really shot up, like on Saturday night, or when my mom said what she said, or right before the fishing trip. And other times, like on Friday morning, it dropped, and I thought, this can't be happening, and this, this isn't happening, and just pretended to, just tried to push it away. Um, Did it ever disappear, though, the sense of fear? Oh, no. From Thursday night to Sunday night, what was your state of mind with respect to whether or not you thought your parents were going to kill you? Well, I always thought they were going to kill me. And what, were there, was there any change over that period in how soon, how immediate you felt their potential of killing you was between Thursday night and Sunday morning? Yes. And up until this point, Sunday morning, at which point did you think their threat of killing you was most, most immediate? Uh, right before, the night before, Saturday night. When your father is outside the door? Yes. So you leave home Sunday, and did you come back midday like you had uh, indicated to your brother that you would? Yes. And when you came back, uh, was there a conversation with him such as he has testified to, where he told you what he thought was strange and what was going on in the house? Uh, no, I, I don't believe he had actually gone into the house yet. Um, okay. And I, uh, if I remember correctly, I was saying, uh, um, Lyle, the whole idea is for you to be able to find out what's going on. And I said, I don't care if you're afraid to go in the house. You got to go in the house. Because if you don't go in the house, we don't know what's happening. And, did, he, uh, did he seem afraid? Yeah, he did not want to go in the house. He was, he, was, he was doing his usual stalling and pretending that he had, you know, that he was going to do it. And, uh, and I, I thought that he might be scared to do it. Well, I knew he was scared to do it, but... Okay, so... so I was just telling him, 
you got to go in the house because I wasn't going in. So you, did you park somewhere where you you believed your car would not be observed? Yeah, I parked in the back alley. Is there a fence that separates your property from the alley? A solid fence? Yeah, you know, there's the fence of the tennis court, and then the fence of a walkway, and then the guest house. And there's a long alley that runs all the way down the houses. If someone is on your property and the fence is there and the gate is closed, could someone see your car from on the property? No. Is that why you park back there? Well, yes. Why did you park back there? Well, I, so my parents wouldn't know I was home. And uh, did you leave again after you talked to your brother midday? Yes. <clears throat> And did you get home late that night or later that night? Yes. Did you get home later than you had told your brother you would? Yes. And what was it, what <coughs> feeling, if any, kept you from getting home earlier? I just didn't want to be at home. And uh, I just really didn't want to have contact with my dad. Why? What were you feeling? I was scared. and. I, I, I was supposed to meet home around 7.30 or 8 or something like that, and I didn't get home till much later. And when you did get home much later, did you see your brother again in the guest house? Yes. And did you have a conversation with him? Yes. And did he then tell you of things that uh, affected the way you felt? <coughs> yes. And the things that he told you, how did they affect the way you felt? What effect did it have? It made me realize that something was going to happen. Well, hadn't you thought something was going to happen all week? Oh, I thought... Had you had any similar thoughts over the course of the week? Oh, I knew something was going to happen, but, but I was hoping that things were turning, you know, going to turn the other way as soon as Lyle had a conversation with Mom or Dad, and he did, and it, it made me realize that something was definitely going to happen. Well, based on what Lyle told you, you independently, is, you're, you're telling us what you independently felt, that in your own mind something was definitely going to happen. Is that what you're saying? Yes. It's not that your brother had to tell you that. Objection. You knew your parents also, did you not? Yes. You had your own relationships with them? Yes, I knew them in some ways better than Lyle. And based on what he told you, did you within your own head, without any prompting from him, feel things were about to happen? Yes. Was there a decision made uh, between you and your brother about leaving? Yeah, I said, we got to get out of here. And Lyle said, we got to tell mom and dad. Well, what was the reason why you had to tell them? If you were afraid of them and you thought something was going to happen, why don't you just sneak out the back and go away? Because I had parked in the front, first of all. And, uh, and, and second of all, we could have avoided them, but he wanted, he wanted them to to, to, he just wanted to say, you know, we're going out and we'll be back and just, I guess, calm things. Was there a, a rule in the family that you were supposed to let your parents know when you were leaving the house and going out for the evening? Uh, no, not, uh, not always. So not on, always. The, on this night you felt that it, it, they should be told? Objection. Why did you tell them on this night if there was no such rule? Because we were, we were trying to pr pretend as if Everything was calm, we didn't think anything was going on, and we were just going out to the movies, and we wanted them to know where we were so that they wouldn't, they wouldn't suddenly do something right away. So they wouldn't think that you were where? You wanted them to know where you were, so yes. they wouldn't think you were where or doing what? Oh, okay. I, I did, did you want, all right, were you concerned about whether or not your father would think that Law was making good on his threat? Yes. His threat to tell? Yes. So did you want them to know where you were? At no, that's part of the reason. Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. What was your thoughts about what you thought your father or mother might be worried about with respect to the two of you? Objection meeting. Overall. We wanted them to know where we were. I mean, we couldn't avoid it on Friday, so we tried to, to, to stay home part of the time. But, you know, most of that weekend, we wanted them to not to think that we were telling anyone or going to any place to do that. And so we were trying to keep them apprised as much as possible of what we were up to so that they wouldn't think that. And uh, okay. that's part of the reason Lyle stayed home. So did you and your brother then go to the house in order to uh, tell your mother that you were leaving? Yes. And 
Can you tell us what happened when you got to the house? I went, uh, we, we went through the kitchen to the back area and uh, Lau went through the kitchen and then there's uh, the den. I don't know if you have the diagram. Yeah, we have the diagram. Um, yes. Remember that the microphone is there. Don't turn away. Okay, then would you show us with the point? Can, are you oriented on the diagram? Yeah. Can you see it? Do you need your glasses that you're in front of you? Yeah, that would help. But the diagram isn't exactly right. right. Well, rather than it's really off. The diagram. All right. Um, if I may approach, uh, yeah, it's it's easy enough. Um, Just slow down. This is the front door. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. And when you entered the house through the front door, was there a living room to the right, and that paneled study to the left? Yes. And then was there a dining room beyond? Yes. Okay. Now is this is this what's throwing you? This indication of stairs. Uh, yeah, partly. There are no stairs there, right? No, there, there are no stairs here. There's no door there, and there should be a door there. Okay, and there are stairs here? Yes. And these stairs go up the top story, is that correct? Yes. <coughs> now, this is what's called the family room. This is the room, ultimately, where you shot your parents, is that right? Yes, I call that the den, though. Okay, you called it the den, and the family called this the study? The study. All right, forgetting the labels for the moment. Kitchen's here. Yes. There's a service porch, and it opens to where? Uh, to the back, uh, back, back side of the patio. To the backyard? Yeah. There's, Is there a tennis court there's back? There's a tennis court right here, and then there's a walkway here. There's a and then there's a maid's room here. Yes. And there's an exit from the maid's room to the side yard. Is that right? Yeah, that was hardly ever used. That was, it was usable, though. Yes. It was there, though, was it? Yes. Okay. Now... Hey, Council, let's put yeah. that coffee down and I'm sorry, uh, put it in a place where it won't uh, be an obstacle to examination. Now, turn this way for a minute and describe how you came in the house. And then you can show us on the diagram, okay? Okay, now describe it. Uh, we came through um, the kitchen area, and I went, I didn't want to go into the den. Uh, so Lyle went into the den, and I guess said he was going out or we were going out. I'm not sure. I went through the dining room into the foyer. Uh, through a door that doesn't show on that diagram, is that right? Yeah, I went right through here. And I went through here. Okay, so you walked, first of all, you went in through what doors from the outside? How'd you get into the house at all? I think we went through the service area. We may have gone through the breakfast room, I'm not sure. Uh, were there doors that led from the breakfast room to the backyard tennis court area? Yeah, those are missing too. It's French doors? Yeah, there should be French doors right there. And then there's also a door that leads right into the service porch? Yeah, right there. Okay, so you went through one of those and you went into the kitchen, correct? Yeah, yes. Now, between the kitchen and the dining room, there was a door, was there not? Yes. And could you go through that door without being observed by people in the den? Yes. And you could also, however, from there, go straight into the den? Yes. What I'd like you to do, this is, I'd like you to draw on that diagram the door that you went through approximately in the approximate position between the kitchen and the dining room. Can you do that, you think? Sure. Here's a pen. If you're whispering to me, it doesn't make any difference. Oh, there's Nobody a, can hear there's you. a door right there. Oh, One of those doors that come open like this. Swings open? Yeah. There's a door there. 
and uh, there's a door there. And when you're in, stay for one second. If you, there's no door there. There's no door there, so you're drawing a solid line on the other side of the dining room. Yes. And on the ground level, there's no stairs here either, is there? No. And this, what's called the entry here, what did your family call this area? The foyer. Now, after you had gone into the dining room, could you hear what was going on in the den with your brother and whoever he was talking to? Well, Lyle, I guess, was sort of walking out, and uh, so my mom came out because the conversation took place. He was right. walking. He, Lyle was coming through here, and, the car, and my mom and Lyle I saw talking right there. Well, why did your brother go into the den and you go into the dining room? I just split up. Because I didn't want to go into the den. And he went into the den for what purpose? To tell them that we were going out. And did you then cut through the dining room and go out into the foyer? Yeah, I went right down in, into here, actually. Um, there's, a, there's no door, but there's a, it's like an arch that go, that that's, leads into the uh, living room. All right, but to come through the dining room, is there a door that leads from the dining room to the foyer? Yeah, I went through the dining room door that leads to the foyer and across the foyer into the archway. So you were waiting for your brother in the archway? Yes. And at that point, did you see your brother or hear your brother? Yes. Which first? I think I saw him. I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm not quite sure which I heard first. I think I saw him. Okay. And when you saw him, did you see your mother as well? Yes. And where were they? They were right in front of the uh, bathroom area, right? This is the bathroom. And then the foyer starts right there. Okay. What, would, uh, what did you hear being said as between your uh, mother and your brother? I heard my mom saying that Lyle and I couldn't go out. And Lyle asking mom, why? Why, why can't we go out? And her saying, because... She started to stutter. She didn't answer. And was there anything about that that uh, you thought was uh, noteworthy or important? Yeah, I started to get the chills right then. Uh, Why? Because they were saying we couldn't go out, and that means that we were going to have to be in the house with them uh, alone, and I didn't like that. I, I was already having a bad feeling, and I was having a worse feeling right then. Was there anything that you had to do the next day where you had to be go to bed early or anything that Lyle was supposed to do that? No, it was a summer day. There was no school. There was no tennis in the morning. So there was no particular reason why you'd have to go to sleep early to get up early? Yeah, that's why it was so strange. I mean, I I thought they would just say, okay, I, I guess. Uh, um, but when she said, no, you can't go out, and then she wouldn't answer Lyle as to why, I was really starting to feel it. What did Lyle say to her when she said, no, you can't go out? Well, what did he say? He was saying, why? Why can't we go out? And how did he sound to you? He sounded, I don't know. You don't remember? I don't remember. Okay, and then, and then your mother started to answer him? She, she didn't. She started, she's saying, because, 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 and she ended up saying, because I said so, because I say so. And, uh, and that's when my dad came out. Did Lyle ask her again before your dad came out, or did your dad come right out? I think my dad came right out. Where did he come from? He came from the den. Could you see him came out? Yeah, I saw him come out, and he said, shut up, kitty. Just another thing as to whether it's... The, this, it says den here. Uh, it's really the study. Well, we called it the study. And it says family room here, and it was a family room, but we just called it the den. No. If I might have a moment, Ron, I want to get another color. I can't write these words. If I may approach you. Yes. Mr. Menendez, what we'll do is we'll put underneath these labels what your family called these rooms. This one here, that was the, room. the study. The record should reflect I've written the word study under the word den. 
This one here, labeled family room. It was called the den. And the record should reflect I've written the word den under that. This is all being done on uh, exhibit six. And this. For the record, there are two exhibit sixes. We'll correct the other one later on. Here we have uh, the word entry, and your family called this area of the house? The foyer. And the record should reflect I've written that word under entry. For, for the record, then, the uh, witnesses indicated that his father came out of the family room as uh, laid originally on that chart. And now says den in red letters. Is that for, correct? For the record, that's what I understood his testimony. Okay, let's not uh, have this uh, conversation. Uh, let's ask a question of the witness and uh, we'll get an answer. So, using both words now that are on the chart, which room did your father come in? The family room slash den. And <clears throat> when your father came out of that room, would you tell us and show us what he did? He said, shut up, kitty. Now, I saw you made a gesture with your right hand. Yeah, he, he used his hands a lot. It, that particular gesture, did you, had you seen that before? Yes, he did that when you wanted he wanted you to shut up or he wanted you to stop moving or he wanted you to be still. He just went... That's a sharp, cutting type motion? Yeah. And did you see him use that to shut your mother up over the course of the years? Yes. And when he said, shut up, kitty, what did your mother do? She shut up. And what did your father do? He told Lyle that he wasn't going out. And um, did he say anything else? Yeah, he told me to get up to my room. He said he'd be there in a minute. He pointed, he pointed to my room. He pointed... He said, get up to your room and I'll be there in a minute. I'm not quite and sure in that <laughs> phrase like that, but that's basically what he said. Do you remember when your father said, you're not going out, do you remember if your brother said anything to him about leaving? No. You don't recall? No, because right after he said, uh, the first thing he did was tell my mom to shut up and then, and then he told Lyle, that he wasn't going out tonight. And then right after that, he told me to get up to my room. And so Lyle just, I guess, responded to that. Well, what did, what did Lyle, how did Lyle respond after your father gestured and said that you were to get up to your room? He, he said, no, you're not gonna touch Eric. And, he, and I'm not, I think he looked at me and, and, and told me to get back down the stairs, but I just specifically remember him saying to dad, you're not gonna touch my little brother, you're not gonna touch Eric, you're never gonna touch him again, that kind of a thing. Okay, did, did Lyle say anything to you about, to the effect of get back down, we're leaving anyway, or anything like that? No, he didn't say get back down, we're leaving. He may have said no, Eric, um, uh, but I just remember him saying that be and because I, I remember thinking to myself, you know, Lyle, what are you doing? Are you crazy? Well, you don't, don't get into an argument right now, right here. Uh, and I was just w sort of going up the stairs real slowly. Did you, in fact, start going up the stairs? Yeah, I started, I was right in front of the stairs, right in the archway, and I started just to walk up the stairs real, uh, real slowly, real, I was hesitant about going up. When your brother said to your father, you're not going to touch Eric, you're not going to touch my little brother again, did your father respond? Yes. And can you tell us first, what kind of tone of voice did your father respond in? He, was, he just jumped at Lyle. He came, he came right over him. And he said, I do what I want in my family. That's not, it's not your little brother, it's my son. And uh, he just was, was, was real uh, yelling at him, real jumping at him. When you say he, he came right over him, did he move towards him? Yeah, he walked right toward him, as if, you know, ready for a, a fight. And I, I couldn't believe, well, I could not believe what was happening. How did Lyle respond when your father came towards him? He just moved back and he said, no, you're not going to touch Eric. And I said, oh, Jesus. Okay, wait a minute. Lyle backed up when your father came towards him? Yeah, Lyle, whenever Dad came toward Lyle, Lyle always got timid and, uh, and, and went away. Got timid? Yeah, you could tell by his face. When your father made this statement to Lyle, what did Lyle say, if anything, in return? Lyle just said, no, no, you're not going to touch him. But his voice was a lot weaker. Did Lyle say anything about still wanting you to go out with him or wanting to leave? He may have said we're leaving, and my dad just 
when he's when he started he, he doesn't really stop he just it's like a rush of, of of wind it's like it's like a hurricane he just and he just said no um, he's my son I say what I want in this family he's not your little brother you're not going out tonight and Lyle was saying no you're not going to touch him and he said don't tell me what to do and he was coming closer and uh, and he just ended it by telling me to go back up to my room because I was sort of lingering on the stairs so this was up and back between Lyle and your father not really up and back it was dad saying what he was saying and Lyle sort of squeaking in, uh, no, you're not going to touch him, no, you're not going to touch him. Okay, well, I was answering. He was trying to say something. Yes. But was the tone of voice different as between the two of them? Yes. And then your father, <coughs> did he say something to you again? Yeah, he, 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 I guess he saw me lingering on the stairs, and he said, get up to your room. And uh, Now, Mr. Menendez, how did you interpret? What did you think your father had in mind? When he first said, "Get up to your room. I'll be there in a minute." I, I, uh, I had, I had two things in my mind. When he first said it, this is before the argument with your brother. Well, I, I knew what he was saying. What, in your opinion, was he saying? That he was going to come up to my room and have sex with me. It's what he always did when he said that. It's what he always did when it's he. It's what he always did when he said it. When he said what? That he'll be there. That he'll be where? When he told me to get up to my room and said that he was coming up, that's what he meant. And would he mean that for various kinds of sex or just one kind or what? Oh, for various kinds, but it, it really depended on how angry he was. Sometimes he said, go up to your room and I'll be there in a few minutes. Sometimes he said, go to your room and I'll be there in a minute. And you could tell by the tone of his voice or how angry he was what type he was going to have. <laughs> what type? you think he was threatening you with when he first said get up to your room on Sunday night? Sex. And over the past uh, three years or so of your life was what you call sex something that was done in anger or something that was done more neutrally by your father? It was done in anger. Did it start out that way? No. Years before? Years before. Now, after your father approaches Lyle and again tells you to get up to your room that he'll be there, what is your state of mind at that point as to what you think your father has in mind? It didn't just change suddenly. It it was one and the other. Oh, I thought they were going to kill us, but I thought Dad was going to have sex, and and there wasn't any doubt about it in my mind. He was At that point, I was more afraid of, of him coming up to my room and having sex than anything else at that at point. At that point. Did something happen that changed that? Yeah. And what happened? Well, I realized from looking at Mom, from looking at Mom, it was real clear what was going on. Well, where was Mom during this exchange where your father was approaching Lyle? When Stead came forward, Mom came up uh, along next to him. She was along the wall, I guess, near the wall of the, uh, on the other side of the bathroom. And she, she walked forward. But during this exchange, where was she? Next to Dad. And how did she look? What was... Well, not right next to him, but a little bit behind him, right next to him. Close to him? Yeah. Okay. And during this exchange between uh, Lyle and your father, what, if anything, did your mother say or do? She didn't say anything. And how did the exchange between Lyle and your father end? It just ended with Dad saying again, you're not leaving this house. And what did Dad do? He went back into the den. And did your mother remain in the foyer after your father had gone back in the den? Yes. And were there any words between your mother and your brother? Yes, I, I didn't hear them uh, all. There were just a few words. I was up in the balcony at this point. You were up on the balcony? Yeah. How did you get there? I, was, I went up the stairs. Once Dad told me to get up my stairs again, I, I could not go up. So you went up and you were at the top of the stairs? Yeah. And were there words between your mother and brother? Yeah, Mom said something like, you ruined this family, or something like that. And Lyle said something to Mom, and I, and I really don't remember. And Do you remember what the Dad came? What? Do 
Do you remember what the subject matter was of what Lyle said to your mother? Did it have anything to do with he you? He said something like, are you going to let this happen, or do you want this, or, you know, I, I thought he was talking about either them killing us or him coming up to my room. I, I didn't know. I didn't hear it too well enough to know exactly what he was saying. Could you see your yes. mother down below from the balcony? Yes. Did you look at her face? I looked at her face on the stairs on the way up. I couldn't really see her face from the balcony. And was there anything about her face on the stairs on the way up that told you anything? Oh, it was clear. It was clear that something was going to happen. Why? What did you see? Uh, just from my mom's face, if you know her different looks, and she has many different looks. What was this look, Mr. Menendez? It was just a stone, resolved look. She didn't look nervous? No. She didn't look frightened? No. She didn't look angry? No. She didn't well, she looked a little angry. Did she look out of control? No. Overall. You've heard people describe your mother when she was irrational and out of control, have you not? Mm-hmm. And they describe this grimace and the fists and that whole thing. Yes, yeah, she used to clench her fists and her whole face would turn red. You've seen it. And you saw it over the course of your life? Yeah, yeah. She's not in that condition at that time, is she? No. Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. Was she in that condition at that time or in some other facial mode? No, she was in a, she was in a, a strong sort of just hard look and uh, uh, not, not out of control, not, not flipping out, not, not any of that. Just, just and, a resolved look and, and I, how did it scared see, me. Excuse me, I'm sorry. How did seeing that look affect you? It scared me. Why did it scare you? Because my mom was not often in control. Um, she was not often completely a, a aware of everything in her surroundings. She was often paranoid or, or I go with words, she would, she would, something would just set her off real easy. And a conversation like this where, where dad was yelling at Lyle or dad was yelling at me, she would take his side immediately and get angry. Take whose side immediately? She would take dad's side uh, immediately and, and get angry with us and either, re, you know, reiterate what dad was saying or, or continue to say what dad was saying or just sit there but really with this, with this angry look on her face and the scowl, that wasn't the case here. So after this exchange between your mother and your brother, what happens next? Uh, dad comes out. Comes out of where? Of the den and grabs mom. The family room slash den? Yes. And he grabs your mother? Mm hmm And what, if anything, does your father say? I don't remember. He says, come don't on remember. or don't waste your time. I don't remember. Okay. Try not to say things you don't remember, okay? Okay. All right. What happens next after your father says something to your mother? They go back into the den and close the door. Now, could you see them close the door? Did you hear them close the door? I saw the doors close. And how could you see that from the balcony? Because you can see it from the balcony. Does the balcony look down on both sides? Yes. Well, there's a, the, the stairs goes up, over, and then there's a the hallway in the balcony. So it's sort of like in a circular, so you can see down. The stairs aren't circular, but it ends up going in sort of the outer edges of a square, let's say, and you can see in the middle of the square. Okay, so there's like an open rectangle. Yes. And what you're calling a balcony is sort of like a gallery, is it not? It's a straight corridor Yeah. that's above the staircase, but then there's an opening and you can see down. Right. And were you watching your parents when they were out there under out there in front of the family room den during this argument? Yes. Were you, uh, how carefully was you, were you watching them? I was really watching them. I was really scared and I was really wanting to know what was happening. I mean, I, I was looking for any sign to see what, what I thought was happening was not happening. And okay. uh, I, just, I just saw them go back into the den. And you saw the doors close? Yes. Now, at that point, Mr. Menendez, what did you think was happening? I thought my dad was going to come up to my room and have sex, and I thought they were going to kill us. You thought both things were going to happen? Yes. And at that point, did your brother come up the stairs? Yes. And did you say anything to your brother? Yes. Okay, now, what do you remember saying to him? 
I remember best you can recall. I, I can't let him come into my room. I, I, I can't. He's not, it's not coming into my room. I, I can't let this happen. Okay. And what did your brother say to you? He said, don't worry about that. Uh, well, he didn't say don't worry about that. He said, he said, I guess he said, don't worry about that. It's happening now. What are you talking about? Something like that. Okay. And, and what did you think already, before your brother said anything to you, what did you think was going to be the result of that night? That I was going to die. And what about your brother? Well, how was he going to do that night? Oh, he, you could tell. I mean, he didn't. No, no. What did you think was going to be the condition of your brother? Oh, I thought he was going to die, night? too. And die at whose hands? My parents. And when your brother said, it's happening now, is that what you already thought? Yeah, that's what I already thought. I mean, it, it really scared me how he looked uh, at the top of the stairs, but I just said, I got to get to the car. Now, when you said it really scared you how he looked, who do you mean? My brother. How did he look that really scared you? He looked really panicked. I mean, over my life, especially that weekend, I really looked at my brother to see how he was looking to sort of judge things because I, I knew that sometimes I wasn't thinking right. And uh, like on Thursday night or on, on Saturday night, I could, I could tell from his expressions. And then on Sunday night, for sure. Did you consider yourself to be uh, different emotionally than your brother? Yes. <coughs> did you cons which of you did you think scared easier? I did. And over the course of your life, was that true? Yes. So in looking to your brother, what were you trying to see over the course of those days? I was in trying him? to see, how, other than what he, he didn't always tell me everything. He, he, a lot of times he protected me and didn't tell me everything or told me gently um, what he felt like when I found mom's suicide letter, her first one. Just tell me what he looked like though. You said you were looking to him to see how he was feeling. Is that right? Yes. And what did you see or hear? On Sunday night? Over the course from Thursday to Sunday. What is your opinion of how your brother was feeling? Oh, he was feeling scared. I mean, and I could tell did. The, I'm sorry. At different times, he was feeling different things. On Thursday night, as soon as I told him what happened with my dad, I remember his face just went white, whiter than mine. I mean, it went white. And I, I remember on, on, on Saturday night after Mom's conversation, he just looked scared, but and, not like he was on Sunday. And on Sunday, how was he as compared to those other times? He was much worse. And how did it affect you, if at all, to see your brother, who was less emotional than you, being scared? It scared the hell out of me. I mean, it, it almost made me lose it right there, out of control. Had that ever happened to you previously in your life, Mr. Menendez? Had you ever lost it emotionally? Why don't you rephrase the question? Okay, you said just then you thought you would lose it and be out of control. Yeah, I felt my, my, my stomach twist, my bowels um, beginning to lose it. Previously in your life, were there times when you, when you lost control? Yes. Physically of your body? Yes. And were those moments when you were feeling what? I was feeling too stressed out, too scared, too nervous. Now, on this occasion, with your brother appearing frightened <coughs> on the stairs, uh, could you compare that to any other occasion in your life? Yes. Okay. Was it the same as other occasions, different than other occasions, the worst, the best, what? Uh, it, was, it was worse than other occasions, but on the other occasions, I let myself go. I would just sort of shake on the floor, and uh, on this occasion, I, was, I knew something was happening. I couldn't do that. So you couldn't lose control? Uh, I was losing control, I, but I wouldn't let myself. I was fighting myself. It's hard to Had describe. You, were there, was there anything in your past that you were aware of, consciously aware of, that was as frightening as what was happening that Sunday on the stairs? Maybe when Dad put the knife to my throat, but that would be the only time. Now, at that point, after your brother talked to you um, no. and said, 
It's happening now. You said your thought was I had to get to the car? Yes. Well, what was in the car? All the shells. Where was the gun? In my bedroom. But you didn't think I have to get to my bedroom? Well, I knew I had to get to my bedroom, but I, I knew from the night before, I, I, for some stupid reason, I didn't load my gun, and I only had still two shells, and so I needed to get to my car. Okay. Did you, where did you go first, the car or your bedroom? My bedroom. And what did you do in your bedroom? I got my gun. And where did you go from there? Out to the car. Now, Mr. Menendez, did it occur to you to simply close the door to your bedroom and sit on the foot of your bed on Sunday night with the two shells in your gun and wait for your father and mother to come? It flashed through my mind. And? Why didn't it you do that? It flashed through my mind to barricade myself in my room, but I knew I wouldn't be able to do that. Why not? Because I, I panicked whenever um, something like that was happening. Well, how, how many times before had something like this happened to you? A lot. Not like this, but them coming into my room uh, a lot. I mean, I, before, before oh, almost all the times with the sex, I would say to myself, I'm not going to let this happen. I'm going to stop it. As soon as he comes into my room, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight him. I'm going to jump on him. I imagine myself on a ledge jumping down on him, all kinds of things to stop the sex. And, and whenever he came into the room, I just... I just crumbled and I couldn't do it. Um, similar like Saturday night. And so did you think on Sunday night that you, if your father was coming into your room or your mother was coming into your room, did you think you were going to fight back or you could have at that point? No, I know I couldn't. Not when he was right in front of me. You recall testifying here that when your father would get angry with your brother, your brother would get timid? Yes. Do you recall hearing the testimony of various coaches that when your father would be on the attack verbally with your brother, your brother would go frozen? Yes. When your father would be on the attack with you over the course of your life, would you have a similar reaction? Oh, yes. I, I, I froze. I, uh, I went dead. I, I usually started to lose control of my body, but when, when Dad was doing that to me, Lyle usually tried to come over and, and protect me and help me. But my point is, did you fight back over N the years with your father? No. Did you verbally resist? No. Apart from Thursday night, did you physically resist? No. Did you think you could? No. Why? Because this was my dad. This was a big guy, and... I don't, I don't, I don't know what it was. Um, I mean, it was just my dad, and it, it was just something about it. I couldn't. I mean, I remember in the sex that when he would come into the room, I would want to say no. I, I don't want to do this, and I would want to say I don't want you to touch me, and, and I would want to say these things. But I would just see him. He was like huge, and. He did what he wanted to me, and I couldn't stop that. And I wanted to, but I couldn't. I don't know why. Well, on, on this occasion, on these two occasions, Saturday night and Sunday night, did you ever envision yourself actually physically fighting back against your father? No. Did you, th what do you think would have happened if your father had approached you with a weapon on Sunday night? Are you asking his state of mind? Yes, at the, at the time. Yes, Why don't you rephrase the question? Then. Thank you. Let, let me withdraw it for the moment. <coughs> Let's do this. You did run out to your car. Yes. And you did load your gun. Yes. What did you do with the two rounds of birdshot that you had put in the gun on Friday? I unloaded them. And why did you do that? Because of what the man said on Saturday. The man said that they weren't good for protection. Yes. And did you then load the gun with the new ammunition? Well, actually, what the man said was that they weren't good for protection because they were these teeny little things that... The question was, did you then load your gun with the new ammunition? Yes. And do you remember how many you put in? I don't remember. It was, it was dark, and I just was reaching in, grabbing, grabbing them and loading them. I, th I think it was five. I think I loaded it all the way that I, I knew how. 
all the way without having to slide the pump down? Yeah, I slide the pump down and then put in another shell like, like he described up like here. Like Deputy Van Horn described, yeah, did no, you I do that? No, I didn't do that. So you put in as many as you could without having to do that? Yes. And are you sure you put in all new stuff? Uh, it was dark. I, I, I tried to do that. I'm, 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 sure, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I, was, I tried to do that. Now, at that point, then, you had a loaded gun, correct? Yes. So why didn't you just wait and see what your father and mother were going to do? Because I was thinking they were coming out. I only thought I had seconds. I thought they were, as soon as they came out of the room, that I was going to die. I had to get to that room before they came out. And going back for a moment to the previous question I was asking you concerning your state of mind, what did you think you would have done if, as you were going into the house, the den doors open and your parents are standing there with firearms? What do you think you would have done? I just would have froze. Excuse me? I would have froze. Were you afraid of that? Yes, I was, I was very afraid of that. I was, I was terrified of them actually getting out of the room. I... And confronting you with a weapon? Objection meeting. Sustained. Question was, what did you think you would have been able to do if they had confronted you with a weapon? Nothing. Now, do you recall as you were going into the den, Mr. Menendez, do you recall thinking something about what your parents were about to do? Yes. And what was the thought that flashed through your head? That they were going to take my gun. Take the gun that you were going in? It, it was this stupidly big thing, and it was just, I, it was, I thought they were just going to grab it. At what point? As soon as I walked in the door. <coughs> did you think they were armed at that point? Did you think they were not armed, or did you not think about that either way? I had thought they were armed, but as I was running toward the foyer, I just remember thinking, they're going to get it. They're going to get this. They're going to get this. It's they're going to get the gun? Yeah. Now, after you entered the den, what do you remember happened? I just remember firing. And did you aim in any particular place? It was just in front of me. And where were you standing? Um... I was standing, I guess, in front of the coffee table. I can't hear you. I was standing in front of the coffee table. In front of the coffee table? Does, how did the coffee table line up with the television set in that room? It's right in front of the television set. Not right in front, but in front of it. And were you, so were you between the television set and the coffee table, or were you between the coffee table and the couch? No, I was between the television set and the coffee table. And how close to the coffee table were you, do you recall? I don't recall. I wasn't close. Were you closer to the television set? Yes. Now, when you went into the room, how soon did you start firing? Immediately. And when you came to this position between the television set and the coffee table, did you keep moving while you were firing, or at some point did you stand still? I don't remember. I think, I guess I kept moving. I just run into the into the room. I guess I, I guess I kept moving. I I, I don't remember. All well, I when remember you say, is firing. When you say you were in between the coffee table and the television set, at what point was that? That was after I finished firing. That's where you wound up? Yeah. You said you were firing directly in front of you. Yes. If you're moving from the doors to the area with the TV and the coffee table, are you firing at the bookcases, which are directly in front of you? No. Or am I not understanding what you're saying? I was just firing as I went into the room. I just started firing. In what direction? In front of me. What was in front of you? My parents. So you were firing at your parents? Yeah. And was Lyle to your right or to your left? Um. He was to my right. He was to my right. 
And could you tell when you first went through the doors where your parents were? I gave it. That's the list I gave you guys. They were in front of us. Where were they in relation to the furniture in the room? Um, behind the coffee table. My dad wasn't, but um, my mom was. When you say your dad wasn't behind the coffee table, where was he? He was, the coffee table ended before the uh, couch, <laughs> I believe, and he was in that area, in, in front of the couch, a little bit to its left, I think. I, I don't remember. I mean, I just saw this figure, which I, I, I think I knew was my dad, and he was right there. I don't and did you see another figure besides the figure of your dad? Yes. And what was, where, what was that figure's position when you first came into the room? To my dad's right. To your dad's right? Yes. And did you get in front of that figure? Did you get to a place where you were in front of that figure? Yes. Okay, and now, am I in front of you right now? Yes. Right, we're not directly lined up. No. Right? But I am, you're in front of me, I'm in front of you, correct? Yes. And do you know if you lined up directly with that second figure or if you were off to the side? I, I don't know. I don't know. I just walked into the room, I just started firing, and I don't know. I didn't think about these things. I didn't think, where was this, where was that? I just started firing, and I don't know. Okay. Did you fire at the second figure? Did you fire at the first figure? Do you know if you fired at both? I don't know. Did you ever get any closer to either of the figures than the area between the television and the coffee table? What? You don't understand my question? No. Let's start again. How far away from the coffee table were you when you remember firing right in front of you? I was as close as I was. I didn't think about it. Well, I, mean, were you I know I ended up two or three feet away. Two or three feet away from what? The coffee table. Two or three feet away from the end of the coffee table or from the side of the coffee table? From the middle of the coffee table. The coffee table had two ends. I was two or three feet away from the center. So you were two feet away from the edge of the coffee table? The edge of the center. So say this is the coffee table. Yes. You're two feet back from it. Yes. I don't want to come right out and blurt it. And that's where you were, you say you ended up? Yes. And were you farther away before that point? Excuse me? You say you ended up there. Yes. Where were you coming from? What direction? The door. So you went from the door to there? Yes. Just across the room. You didn't go forward and back, like towards and away from the coffee table? No. You said you were closer to the TV than the right. coffee table. Is that right? Yes, I think so. It's not a whole lot of room. Um, well, Mr. Menendez, the television set is more than four feet away from the coffee table, isn't it? Probably four feet, and I was standing in the middle, two feet away from each. Y Mr. You're asking Mendez, me to remember these things that I, I don't. The coffee table's about 12 feet away from the coffee table. The TV is about 12 feet away from the coffee table, wasn't it? 12 feet away? It's completely across on the far wall of the room, isn't it? Yes, but the coffee table's in the center of the room. Okay. The coffee table was not 12 feet away from the, from the TV. It was maybe four to six feet. And so you were equidistant between the TV and the coffee table. Is yes. that what you think, more That's or less? I, more or less. However far it might have been? Yes. And when you ended up, wherever you ended up, was the firing over? Yes. And yes. What, had stopped the, what had stopped the firing? Why did it end? I just fired as much as I could. And how much was as much as you could? Did you empty the gun? or Every did shell I had. And after you had done that, did something happen? Yes. Yes. When... You f after you had stopped firing, was the condition of the room different than when you started? Yes. What was different about the condition of the room, not the people? Oh, man. 
I didn't really see the condition of, of the people. I just saw there was a lot of smoke. It was dark. There was light coming in from the from the uh, from the hallway from the TV, and it was real. It was real eerie. The TV was making illuminating lights, and it was it was horrible. Was it darker before the shooting or after in the room? Yeah, I was just on the phone. Before. It was darker before you shot? Yes. I don't understand. You said there was smoke in the room after. Well, Sustained. Rephrase the question. Did the smoke make the room darker, Mr. Menendez? The, the smoke made it harder to see. That's, my, that's what I'm asking you. But it wasn't. <coughs> All right, rephrase the question. Was it harder to see in the room after the shooting or before? After. When you went in the room, were the room lights on? No. Was the television on? Yes. After the shooting, was the television still on? Yes. Were the room lights still off? Yes. Was there now smoke in the room? Yes. When the shooting ended, could you see either your father or your mother? Um, yes. Who could you see? My father. And where was he at that time? He was on the couch. Could you see your mother? No. Now, what was it that happened after the shooting ended? I heard a noise from my mom. And what was your reaction to that noise? I just ran out of the room. What did the noise, physically you ran out of the room, how did the noise make you feel? It scared me, I just wanted to get out of there. And where did you go? Uh, out through the foyer, into the front door. Lyle was right there. Where did you go? To the car. And when you got to the car, what did you do? Um, I started scrambling. Lyle and I were scrambling for any shell, any shell he could find, and I just handed him one. You found a shell? Yes. Do you know which kind it was? No. New one or old one? I didn't look. And you gave it to Lyle? Yes. And then what happened? Uh, Lyle ran back in the house, and I sort of followed. I didn't want to go back in. Well, did you go back in the house? Yes. And did you go back to the den? No, I didn't go in the den. Did you go back to the den? Yes. And did Lyle go back to the den? Lyle was already in the den by that point. And could you hear anything after you got back to the den? Um, I just heard uh, a fire of a gun. You heard what? I heard Lyle fire the gun. You heard the gun, a gun go off? Yes. Did you see Lyle firing the gun? No. Where were you exactly when you heard the firing of the gun? I was coming toward the den. Yes, where were you exactly? In the hallway. And where was your brother when you next saw him? Coming out of the den. And at that point, when he came out of the den, what did you do? I, uh, I just sat on the stairs. You sat on the stairs? Yes. And what did he do? He sat on the ground across from me. Now, you heard your brother testify that the two of you were sitting in the foyer area for some period of time before there was any further conversation? Yes. Did that happen? Yes, not as long as he, he said, but... Your happened. recollection is it wasn't quite as long as he said? No, I think he said something like 10 minutes or something like that. Did, did you like think it was that long? No. How long do you think it was? Just a few minutes. Excuse me? Just a few minutes, like three, four minutes. I, I don't know. I mean, it just it seemed like a long time, but uh, I wasn't really thinking about time. 
Your Honor, this would be a good time, speaking of time, to take a break. All right. We'll take a recess. Please uh, return at uh, 15 minutes after the hour and don't discuss this case with anyone and don't form any final opinions about it. Resume at 11.15. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Menendez, calling your attention back to Sunday night, you and your brother are seated in the foyer, you said? Yes. And after a <coughs> few minutes, uh, do you and your brother have a conversation? Yes. And uh, was anything mentioned in that conversation about the, the fact that the police hadn't come? Yes. And after that conversation, did you go back into the family room den and do something? Uh, yes. What did you do in that room? Um, Lyle got his gun and, uh, and then we picked up the shells. And where was your gun? My gun was on the stairs in the foyer. Now, do you remember generally where the shell casings were that you picked up? Yes. And where were they? They were right around the door area. Um, well, what? before you look at the diagram, it were right around the door area, the entryway into the room? Yeah, they were right inside that area. Were there anywhere near the table that's shown on that diagram as being uh, to the side of the couch? Yes. The one that just says table, the eight-sided one. Can you show one. with the pointer the general area where the casings were? Right around here. That area? Yeah. <coughs> were there any, did you go anywhere near your mother and father when you went back in the room? No. Did you go at any time behind the couch when you went back in the room? No. So the area that you've just shown us, is that the only part of the room that you went into when you went to pick up the casings? Yes. And were the casings uh, under anything, or were they just on the floor? They may have been under the table. Most of them were just on the floor. So some may have been under that, is that an oct octagonal table that's to the side of the couch? Yeah, if that's an eight-sided table. Okay, and, and that's what you meant by the table? Yes. Now, after doing that, did you and your brother leave the house? Yes. Now, you heard your brother testify to what you did after you left the house? Yes. Did you go to the uh, AMC 14 movie theaters in Century City? Yeah. Sustain. Did you do what your brother said you did concerning a theater? Yeah, we, uh, we went over to the theater. And uh, at some point, did you receive some tickets? Uh, Lyle did, and he gave them to me. And did you notice a time on those tickets? Yes. And as a consequence, did you not show those tickets to the police later? Exactly, no. And did you then, after the theater, go somewhere to do something with the guns? Yes. And where did you go? Um, up to Mahalan. And did you do with the guns what your brother said you did? Yes. You dumped them down the side of the hill? Objection, baby. Sustained. And after doing something with the guns, did you go to Santa Monica? Yes. And do you recall the route you took? to get from Mulholland Drive to Santa Monica? Yes. And would you tell us what the route was? Uh, up to Mulholland, we just took cold water, since I'm the one that knew where Mulholland was. And um, we just took the, f the fastest way, Sunset to the 405. Mulholland doesn't intersect Sunset. How'd you get to Sunset? We went back down cold water. Okay. And uh, from the 405, that's the San Diego Freeway? Yes. And where did you go from the 405? To the 10. That's the Santa Monica Freeway? Yes. And that took you into Santa Monica? Yes. And do you recall being at the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium? Yes. And did you see anything like uh, exhibits or tents in the parking lot area there? Yes, it, there was a fence area. And then I guess the tents or exhibits were inside the fence area. And at any time, did you get out of the car and go into that fenced area? Uh, at one point, yes. And did you encounter your brother at that point? Yes, he was coming out. Now, at some point that evening after leaving the house, 
Did you throw away some clothing? Yes. What kind of clothing did you throw away? Um, my pants and uh, that's all the clothing I threw away. Let me ask you the question again. What kind of clothing did you throw away? Did you just answer that question? Y yes. Okay, next question. Did you throw away anything in addition to your pants? No. Do you know if your brother threw away any clothing? Uh, he did. Do you know what he threw away? Um, I believe it was only his shoes. And how were these, were other items thrown away at the same time that the pants and the shoes were thrown away? Yes, we were just scrambling to get whatever was in the back of the car, whatever we could find that was obvious. Did you look in the back of the car as well as your brother? It was a hatchback. The hatchback was open. I'm uh, sorry. Did I ask you if the hatchback was open? I looked. Ask in your the, next question. Did you look in the car yourself, Mr. Menendez? Yes. Did you reach and obtain items in the back of the car yourself? Yes. Did you put them in something before you put them in the dumpster? I know there was a tennis bag there, and we put some of the things in the tennis bag, some of the things we just threw in the dumpster. And what did you do with the tennis bag after you put things in it? We threw it in the dumpster. There were a number, were there a number of tennis bags in the back of your car? Yes. Now, do you recall specifically where in the chain of events, the movie, Mulholland Drive, the Santa Monica Civic, where in the chain of events you threw away the clothing in the tennis bag? No. Do you know if it was before you got to the Santa Monica Civic or after you were at the Santa Monica Civic? I'd always thought it was after, but it very well could have been before. So you're not certain about that? No. And do you know what city or area, uh, we'll strike that, was the dumpster at a service station, gasoline station? Sustained. What kind of premises was the dumpster at? It was at a gas station. It had a little, I think it had a little car wash there. It was a big, it was a big place. Was it a gas station? Yes. And do you know what city or town or area the gas station was in? Santa Monica. And do you recall after being in Santa Monica, returning home? Yes. And do you recall the route for getting home? Yes. Mr. Menendez, had you spent more time in Los Angeles since 1986, or had your brother spent more time in Los Angeles since 1986? I had much more. Which of you, if either, was more familiar with the roads, the freeways, the routes? I was. Which of you on Sunday night was driving? Lyle was. And which of you, if either, was giving directions? I was. Now, what kind of emotional condition were you in by the time you headed home? Uh, I was crying. I know I was shaking. I was uh, not in a good emotional condition. And what about your brother? Was he in a good emotional condition? No, uh, he wasn't. He was making a lot of mistakes on the road. I was trying to tell him to get it together. Okay. Did you feel at that time that you were capable of meeting with Harry Berman or any other friend? Overall? No, uh, not at all. Now, when you got back to the house, what did you do? I went into the room where my parents were. Would you back up a little? Why did you do that? I don't know. Um, I just couldn't stop myself. I was just drawn to the room. I didn't really want to go in, but I could not go in. And when you did go in, how did it affect you, if at all? Uh, it affected me. Um, I, just, I just started crying a lot harder. At um, one point I started to scream. It was awful, and I just I couldn't handle what I was seeing. 
Do you recall hearing the 9-11 uh, tape that was played? Yes. Were you in the room with your brother when he was calling the police? No. Were you on the same floor of the house? No. Where were you when, to the best of your knowledge, your brother was calling the police? I believe I was in the den. I mean, I don't know exactly at what point he was on the phone with the police. I assume when he went upstairs. But uh, after he went upstairs, I went back to the den. You had been in the den. Did he come and get you? Yes. Did he get you out of there? Yeah. And did he go upstairs? Yes. And you went back in? Objection leading. Sustained. After he went back upstairs, what did you, after he went upstairs, what did you do? I went back in the den. And uh, you don't know why? No. Were the lights still on? Yes. And when had the lights been put on? Um, when we were picking up the shells. When you got back home, was your state of what was your state of mind with respect to whether or not your parents were dead? I mean, logically, I knew they were dead, but I just couldn't. I couldn't accept that. I couldn't believe that. I. I couldn't. I couldn't believe that they were dead. It and just when seemed, you I'm sorry. It just seemed too much for me. When you saw them in the den later, didn't they appear to be dead? Yes. And did you accept it then that they were dead? Yeah. Well, yes, I, I accepted that they were dead and that they were gone. Um, but I, I still couldn't believe that. Um, it just seemed too, it just seemed impossible to me. What was impossible about it? The fact that my mom and dad could be killed, it just didn't seem it just seemed impossible. Did you think they were immortal? Sustained. Why did you find it hard to believe that they could die? Because they were, they were my parents, and they had always been in my life, and uh, I just never thought they could really die. Just because you needed them, or because they were incapable of dying, or they were too strong to die, or what? I don't really know. I, 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 they were so powerful and they were so overwhelming in my life that it just, I never thought that they would, they would go away. I never thought that they would not be in my life. And uh, it was hitting me that they w were not in my life. And it just, it just seemed uh, unreal. Did they seem unreal when you went back into the den? Was there something about the way they appeared that didn't seem... Natural? Yeah. Sustained. The answer is stricken. Mr. Menendez, you heard played in this courtroom a uh, tape of your interviews with uh, Sergeant Edmonds and with Detective Zoller? Yes. Do you recall on one or both of those you're describing your parents looking like wax figures, not seeming real? Yes. Is that an impression you for At what time did you form that impression? Um, both... Uh, a, a little when I was picking up the shells, although I was trying really not to look at them. I was really doing everything I could to stay away from them, but it was after when I was looking at them and I couldn't, I couldn't stop myself. When you say after, do you mean when you returned to the house? Yeah, when I returned to the house later that night. What we're talking about now? Yes. Now, after your brother made the call, the police arrived, is that correct? Yes. And uh, you eventually wound up at the station and you gave the statement to Sergeant Edmonds that we heard? Yes. Now, Mr. Menendez, over the course of that week, particularly as between Thursday and Sunday night, you have described the fact that you were in fear. Who were you in fear of? My parents. Both of them? Yes. And were you in fear of them independently or together as a unit or both? I'd say both. Definitely also independently. Had your parents worked together as a unit in the past to frighten you? Yes. Was that something that happened more than once in your life? Yes. Can you recall the earliest time in your life when your parents worked together 
to frighten you? The earliest time I can remember. Yes, when is that earliest time? When I was, uh, Where were I you guess living? it was the North Mill Roadhouse, right after Muncie, before Pennington. Okay, and that's that, the house in, uh, I think it's called West Windsor, New Jersey, outside of Princeton? Yes. Was there some feature that that house had that was different than some of the other houses you had lived in? Yes. What did that house have? It had a basement. Not and just had a basement, but it was an unrugged basement. Unrugged? Y yeah. What do you mean? There wasn't any rug or carpet on the basement floor. Okay. What was the basement floor made of? It was cement. Was this basement... You know what the difference is between a finished basement and an unfinished basement? Objection irrelevant. Overall. Uh, yeah, I guess. Um, it, well, it, it, uh, do you know the difference between a finished basement and an unfinished basement? You know what the difference is? That's the question. No. Okay. Did the basement of this house look like a room in a house, or did it look like... It looked similar to the one in Princeton. It was... It was dark. There were round poles, I believe. It was cement. The walls were sort of... It, it wasn't a room that you would be in. It was a room that you'd store boxes in and things okay. like that. It was like a storage area, not a living area. Yes. So it was an unfinished basement. Yes. Okay. Now, did something occur that you remember when you lived in that house um, having to do with the basement? Yes. Okay, would you tell us what happened? Um... I was downstairs in the basement with my mom, and I don't remember what she was doing. We were getting some things, and at one point she started to leave, and so I was following after her, and she started going up the steps, and so I started going up the steps with her, but she was further ahead from me. She was, I was walked slow, and, uh, and then as she got to the top of the stairs, she closed the door and she shut off the lights. Now, was she inside the basement when she closed the door and shut off the lights? No, she was outside. And where was the switch for the lights, inside the basement or outside? Outside. Okay, so at that point, she's outside the basement. Where are you? I'm inside the basement at the top of the stairs. Now, Mr. Menendez, do you know how old you were when you lived at that house on Mill Road in West Windsor? I guess I was seven. That's the years that I lived there. You lived there one year? Yes. Okay, so what happened after your mother went out and closed the door and turned off the light? I started hearing a noise. Before you heard the noise, did you do anything? Oh, I was pounding on the door, um, begging my mom to open up the door because I was... Why? Because it was dark. It was pitch black, and I was very scared. Were you afraid of the dark when you were little? Yeah, I was terrified of the dark. Did your mother know that? Had she been told? Well, she was told by me. That's what I mean. You... Yes. Okay, so after you're pounding on the door, you hear a noise? Yes. And where is the noise coming from? Inside the basement. Are you at the top of the stairs at this point? I'm at the top of the stairs, and the noise is coming from the inside the basement in the back. Below you? Yeah. Okay, what kind of noise is it? It's like a ghost noise. What's a ghost noise? Like a ooh, ah, that kind okay. of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And how did that make you feel? terrified me. I, I didn't know what it was, and uh, I was really scared of it, and I started banging on the door. Uh, Did you say anything while you were banging on the door? Yes, I was begging for my mom to open up the door, because there was something in the basement. When you say you were begging your mom, do you know what you... What kind I was of saying, please open up the door, please open up the door. Were you calling out her name, or mom, or...? I don't remember. Okay, so then what happens? And the noise started getting closer, and I heard it, a box move. I heard something move in the basement, and it was getting closer. And I, I remember the feeling of the, the chills all over my body as it was getting closer, and I would hear it get closer, and I was pounding on the door and pounding on the door, and it just got closer until it was at the bottom of the stairs. And eventually what happened? It, I, 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 you know, I heard the footsteps coming okay. up the stairs. Came and, up the stairs? Yes, and then it just jumped at me with a big, yeah. And uh, what was it? It was my dad. It was your father? Yeah. And uh, when he jumped at you, what did you do? I screamed. I panicked. 
You screamed. I panicked and I just held my, up, my hands up in the air. What happened after that? He started laughing. He started laughing? Yes. And what happened with respect to the door and the light? My mom opened up the door and turned on the light. And what was she doing? She was laughing. And uh, then I take it, did you start laughing too? No, I was crying and I just wanted to get out of the basement. Now, do you recall when you were living in the Pennington house, um, another incident when your parents frightened you together? Yes. When you were living in the Pennington house, um, Mr. Menendez, I think you previously testified you would have nightmares. Yes, I had uh, a lot of nightmares. How would these nightmares come and go? They would come for months at a time, for two months, three months. I would go to bed every night knowing I was going to have the same nightmare. And, uh, and I would say to my mom, I, I'm, I can't go to sleep tonight. I'm going to have the, I'm gonna have the dream. And she was saying, no, you've got to go to sleep. You've got to go to sleep. It'll be fine. And I was saying, I can't get to bed. Now, would there be a time, if you had the nightmare for two or three months every day, would there be a time when you wouldn't have the nightmares at all for a while? Yes. Now, was there some ritual that you worked out for the two or three month time when you were having the nightmare, something that had to be done every night before you could get into bed and try to go to sleep? Excuse me? Sustain. The next question. Was there something you would do during these two or three month periods before you'd go to bed at night? Yes. What would you do? I would check every drawer, every closet underneath the bed. Check for what? Check for the monsters in my dream. Make sure there was nothing in there. There was no one hiding. And did your mother get involved in this? Sometimes. And how did she know about this? Well, because sometimes I'd be too scared to check it on my own and I would want her there. Had you told her about the nightmares? Yes. Had you told her about the checking? Yes. Okay. Do you recall on an occasion when you wanted to do the checking that your mother was with you? Yes. Okay. Would you tell us about that occasion? She was sitting on the bed and uh, I was going around to check the doors. I wanted her to do it, but she was saying, no, you do it. You've got to be brave. Um, you have to get old and, and be able to do these things yourself. And so I was checking the drawers and, uh, and I went to the closet and I opened up the closet, the right closet, and this thing came down at me and I jumped back. What was the thing that came down on you? It was a, a mask of a witch, this green mask. And was that something you knew you had in the house? No. You had never seen it before? No. And what happened after the mask fell down from the closet on you? Um, my uh, dad came out of the doorway and started laughing. The doorway to your room? Yes, he was apparently around the corner. Hiding? Yes. And what did you do after your dad started laughing? I, I just looked at my mom and I was crying. I just ran out of the room. Where'd you run to? Downstairs into the room um, next to the door. Did that room next to the door have a particular name? It was called the green room. And eventually, did you see your mother in the green room? Yes. And did she say anything to you while you were in there? Yes. What were you doing in the green room after you'd run out of your bedroom? I was crying in the corner. And what did your mother say to you when you saw her in the green room? She said that she was sorry, but I had to be brave and had to get rid of these dreams and, and, and confront these dreams and, uh, and to be, be strong, that, that I, I can't cry my way through this. Had you ever told your mother that one of the recurring figures from your dreams was a green face? Oh, yes. She knew about my dreams. Now, did uh, these episodes when your parents frightened you together make you a less fearful child? No, not at all. Did they make you brave? No. Was there something else your father would do on a regular basis with respect to the family car that frightened you? Yes. And what would your father do uh, in the car that would frighten you? He would put his knees on the steering wheel 
and steer the car uh, toward the side of the road, usually a big ditch or a big fall off drop, and, uh, and tell me he wasn't going to turn the wheel. And what would happen? And the car would be going right toward the side of the road off the cliff or the ditch. And would your mother be in the car when he was doing this? Sometimes. And how would you react to him doing that? I would be screaming and saying, turn the car, turn the car, and he'd be playing with his knees and, uh, and not turning the car. Basically, he, he was waiting for me to turn the car at one, one point. Uh, wait, he was waiting for you to, how were you going to do that? To, to grab the steering wheel. Okay. Well, were you sitting in front? I, some, sometimes I was sitting in front, sometimes I was sitting in the back seat and I'd jump over and I'd grab the steering wheel. I knew eventually that all I had to do was grab the steering wheel and he would turn the car. That he was just waiting to see how long I would go before we went into the to the uh, ditch. So why didn't you do it right away? Why didn't you grab the steering wheel right away? Because I wanted my dad to be proud of me and I wanted to make him seem like I was brave and that I could I could do this and I didn't have to turn the steering wheel and that I wasn't afraid. But you always did, didn't you? Oh yes, I, I eventually always did. Well, if you hadn't turned the steering wheel, do you think your father would have driven the car into the ditch or do you think he would have stopped it? Oh, he would have stopped. I mean, I didn't think so at the time, but I, I know now he would have stopped. So what made you scream and grab the steering wheel? Because he would get too close to the ditch, and, and I would think that he was really going to go into the ditch. And so I would scream, and either jump over the seat or just grab the steering wheel and try to turn it. Now, did your mother ever stop this when she was in the car? No. And how did it make you feel, this experience? Was this pleasant? No, it scared me. And did your father do this more than once? Yes, he did it many times. And did it scare you less each time? It, would, it didn't scare me as much as the first time or the second time, but as we started getting close to the ditch, it got really scary because I, I thought he was really going to go into the ditch when I was there. So did it... Over how... Over how, what period of years did your father do this, driving with his knees towards the ditch trick? When I was seven, eight, nine, ten. So it went on for quite a while. Yeah, whenever he felt like it. And every time it happened, was it the same kind of experience for you? Yes. Do you remember hearing uh, Mrs. Goldsmith in this trial testify about a time that your father left you in a cemetery? Yes. To toughen you up or make you brave? Yes. Do you remember the time you were in the cemetery? No. Were there other things that you remember your parents doing to try to toughen you up or make you brave? Yeah, they would do all kinds of things. Let's talk about your mother for a minute. Um, how would your mother react? Um, or treat you if you were injured or ill? Um, she would just treat me and... Uh, I don't understand what that means. She would just clean up the wound. And? And that's it. Would she ever say anything? You, I'm sorry, you feel bad. How does it feel, honey? Does this hurt? No. Did she ever call you honey, by the way? No. Did she ever call you by any pet name of any kind? No. What did she call you? She called me Eric. And did she call you other names, negative names? Yes. Mr. Menendez, do you have a scar on your left elbow? Yes. And do you know how you got that scar? When I fell off a bike. And how old were you when that happened? Five years old, I guess. Five? Maybe six. I was in Muncie. And was this uh, a new bike, an old bike, what? It was a brand new bike. Excuse me? It was a brand new bike. Did you hear your cousin, um, Alan, testify to watching your father doing something with you on a bike? Yes. Did that sound familiar? Yes. Do you remember those bike riding training sessions with your father? Uh, yes. Did those kinds of things, ha did that, this thing that your cousin Alan described with you being pushed down the hill into the cul-de-sac? Yes. Did that happen more than once? Yes. 
And do you remember the specific occasion on which you got the scar on your left elbow? Yes. And would you tell us what happened? Um, actually, Your Honor, it's afternoon. All right, we'll recess until 1.30, ladies and gentlemen. Don't discuss this case with anyone. Don't form any final opinions about it. And we'll resume at 1.30. Mr. Menendez, you were about to tell us, from your perspective, um, an episode of one of these bicycle riding lessons. Remember? Yes. Where did you live at the time? In Muncie. And is there a particular day of this that you recall? Yes. And would you just tell us what happened on that day? Um, my dad was telling me that in order to get the bike, I had to be able to ride it. Uh, so he wanted me to go down from where the house was, down the hill and around the cul-de-sac and back up. And so he would put me on the bike and, um, and he would run along with the bike and push the bike down the hill. And how, um, what, what kind of curve was there on this cul-de-sac? It was just a circular curve. It was, a was it a tight curve, a wide curve? It was a tight curve. And on this particular day, what happened when he pushed the bike down the hill into the cul-de-sac? Well, I wasn't old enough to, uh, um, I just didn't know how to ride the bike very well. And so I couldn't quite get around the curve. So I would just jump off onto the grass. Um, as I remember the first time, he told me I had five turns this time, five tries. And uh, so the first first time to get around the cold sack, I wasn't able to, and I had to jump off onto the grass. And did you do this again? I did it the second time I jumped off onto the grass, and the third, and um, and the fourth until it was my last turn around the, uh, uh, my last try around the turn. And... Um, did, you fa did your father react uh, after each time when you would jump off? Yeah, he was, he was very upset. He was, uh, he was not angry. I mean, he was very angry when uh, I would jump off and then he would come back and say, do not jump off, do not jump off. Even if you fall, try to go around the, the cul-de-sac. And, uh, and then in the last time, he told me that this was the last time that I had uh, my last try that day. And what happened? He pushed me down, and I, I, I said to myself, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to jump off this time. And, uh, and I just said to myself, I'm not going to jump off as I'm going around the turn. And the bike fell because I couldn't ride it well, and I, and I fell down. And what happened to you? I cut up my arm really badly. And were you bleeding? Yes. So um, did they take you <clears throat> for medical treatment? No. Did you ever get the... Uh, the cut on your elbow stitched? No. How large a scar do you still have there, Mr. Menendez? Can you show us? It was a large, it's still a large scar. Well, without rolling up your sleeve, can you show us with your fingers? It's like that. About two inches long? Yeah. Now, was your mother home when your elbow was cut open? She was there watching. Did she leap from her feet when you fell and run to your side? No, my dad was very upset um, that I had actually fallen. He really wanted me to make it around. He told me I could fall, but he was upset that I did. Was he upset that you were hurt? Was he... No, he was just upset that I wasn't able to make it around that cul-de-sac. With whom, if anyone, was he upset? With me. And what do you recall he did, if anything, with the bicycle after you injured your arm? He threw it in the garage, told me not to touch it. Now, was this supposed to be your bicycle? Was it a new bicycle for you? Yes. And were you allowed to play with it in between these bike riding lessons? No. Well, the purpose of the lesson was what? When, when I'm not you... sure. Um, the purpose of the lesson, I assumed, was so that I would learn how to ride the bike, but he wasn't really teaching me how to ride the bike. He just was giving me five tries in order to keep the bike. I had to be able to do this turn. What do you mean, keep the bike? In order to be able to have the bike whenever I wanted and to use it, I would have to be able to do this turn. Do you have any recollection of how long it was after this day that you actually made it around the cul-de-sac and could keep your bike? No, I think it was a few months, month, two months. Do you know if there were more such lessons as the one you've described today? Overall. Yes, there was. And when I finally made it around the turn, that's when I was able to keep the bike. Do you remember finally making it around the turn? No. Do you think that this day is, uh, I'll strike that. 
Do you think this day occurred in the summertime, the wintertime? When? I would think it was in the summer. Now, at this time in your life, Mr. Menendez, when you lived in Muncie um, and you were about six years old? Yes. How would you describe um, your relationship with your father in the sense of how did, what did you think your father thought of you? Uh, I didn't think he liked me very much. And why was that? Because I used to cry a lot and because I wasn't, I wasn't as strong as Lyle and I wasn't as good as Lyle in the things he wanted me to do. And how did he express it? Well, did he express in any way that he didn't like you very much? In your mind? Yes. What kinds of things did he do that made you believe he didn't like you very much? He told me that I was a sissy, that I was a coward, and that I wasn't good enough to be in the family. He hit me. He hit me with the belt. He, he did all kinds of things. Now, at some point in your sixth, well, strike that, did you see a different relationship between Lyle and your father? Yes. Now, did, you, did your father also hit Lyle? Yes. Was he also mean to Lyle sometimes? Yes. But what was it your father said or did that was different with respect to Lyle than with respect to you? I don't know. He just seemed to care more about Lyle. Um, in my mind, it was pretty clear. And uh, were you happy being Eric, the number two son no. in that family? What did you want to be? I wanted to be like Lyle. I wanted to be... Um, as good as Lyle. I wanted to be liked as much as Lyle. Now, did something happen during your sixth year with your father that made you think that perhaps your father did like you after all? Yes. And uh, could you tell us what started happening during your sixth year that led you to believe that? Um, he, uh, he used to, um, come into my room and uh, give me massages. Now, when you say your room, did you share a room with Lyle? Yes. During this time when you were six, uh, how old was Lyle? Uh, Lyle was, I guess, nine. And was Lyle very involved in competitive sports at that time? Yes. And were there any times when Lyle was not home when you were? Uh, yes. And when your father would come into your room to give you massages, would Lyle be present? Yes. In the room? No, Lyle would be home. Was he always home? Yes. I thought you just said there were times when Lyle was not home. There were... Okay, just uh, rephrase the question. This is so hard. Okay. Were there times when Lyle was not home when you were home alone with your father? Yes. Were there times when Lyle was not home, when you were home alone with your father and your father was giving you massages? Yes. And were there times when your father was giving you massages when Lyle was home? Yes. Okay. And would the same be true of your mother? Yes. Would she be home? Sometimes she was out with Lyle. Um, sometimes she was home. It really didn't matter at that time. If your father were alone in a room with you, would other people enter or leave the room during the time that your father was there? No. Would it matter what your father was doing in the room? In other words, it didn't said matter if he was hitting me or if he was just talking to me or if he was giving me massages. No one ever entered the room. My dad was alone with me. And was the same true when your dad was alone with your brother, for whatever purpose? Yes. So your mother, mainly you're saying your mother never went into your bedroom whether you were in there or Lyle was in there, when your father was alone with one of you? No. Sustain. Answer stricken. Did you ever see your mother in, enter your bedroom when you were there with your father? No. Did you ever hear your mother knock on the door of your bedroom when you were alone in there with your father? No, my mother never came. And what about when Lyle was in the bedroom with your father? No, she told me not to go near the door. Did One. you ever see her go near the door? No. Now, Mr. Menendez, these massages that your father gave you in your room in, in Muncie, was this the first time your father had ever massaged you in any way? No. What were the previous massages like, and where did they occur? Uh, at swimming. 
he would massage my legs, my thighs, my calves to get me ready to go swimming. And the massages in your room, how did they begin? I mean, what types of massages were they in the beginning? Just the body massages. Like what you got for swimming? Similar. He would have me strip off my clothes until I was just wearing my underwear and lie down on my stomach. And would he tell you why he was massaging you? Yes. What would he say? He would say it's just to relieve the, the stress because he would say that the stress built up because of sports and there, there was so much uh, tension and, and uh, stress that I would need to do this to relax. And at some point, while you were still living at Muncie, did the massages change in character in any way? Yes. And what was the change? Um, he had me take off my underwear. And when you took off your underwear, did he do things that he had not done before? Yes. What did he do? Um, he would have me turn over onto my back. Okay. What would he do? He would massage my genitals. And did that go on? I mean, how frequent were these massages? Two, three times a month. And was there a period when the massages would be what you've just described, and then they changed again? Something new was added? I don't understand. When your father massaged your genitals, as you've just described, was he using his hands? Yes. At some point after that, did he start doing something else? Yeah, very soon after. I, I don't even really distinguish between times. Um, what was the next type of activity called? What did he call it? Uh, massaging me with his mouth. And what part of your body would he massage with his mouth? My penis. And how did your father behave with you when these massages were taking place? How did he treat you? He was great. Um, he was he was kind. Uh, he never said anything negative to me. Uh, he told me that I was part of the family and that that I belonged, and that this was this was good. And did he tell you anything about the activity he was engaged in with you? Did he tell you anything about the massages? What were they? They were to relieve the stress and the tension, and that's what they were there for. Were they something that you were supposed to tell everybody about? No, of course not. No. Why do you say, he, of course not? Well, well, he explained to me very clearly that this was something between us, and what he said is that this would stop if I told anyone, and that I wouldn't be alone with him anymore, and then I wouldn't get this attention. So he told you to keep it a secret? Yes. Um, and did you want it to stop? No. Why? Because it was the only time I got to uh, spend alone with my dad. It was the only time I got to be with him and, and for him to be nice and caring with me. So did that make you feel better about your relationship with your father, these massages that were happening? Made me feel like... Overall, your answer. Made me feel like I had a relationship with my dad. Now, apart from these times when he was alone with you, doing these massages, did he treat you better than he had in the past? Yes, he, he, he seemed to care about me. He seemed to love me, and, uh, and that's all that I wanted. Now, is that both when he's doing the massages and at all other times? In other words, did he suddenly become nice to you all the time? No, only when he was in the room. Well, my question is, when he was not in the room, how was his behavior towards you? He was like he always was. He was mean. He was sarcastic. He didn't seem to care about me very much. He was just like he normally was. And strike that. Now, for as long, uh, from, from the beginning of these massages in your room, for as long as you lived in Muncie, did your father do the things that you've already described, these hand and mouth massages? Yes. At some point, you recall the family moved to New Jersey? Yes. And do you recall any activity like this, massages type activity occurring 
uh, in the house on, and I can not remember if it's north or south, but Mill Road. Yes. And was it the same kind of activity, the hand and mouth massages? Um, yeah, it was similar. It changed at one point, but uh, it was the same type of activity. Now, in addition to that activity, which was what he was doing to you, uh, had he at any point while you lived in Muncie uh, started asking you to do things to him? Yes. And up until the point when you left Muncie, what sorts of things did he have you do to him? Um, he was just asking me to massage uh, his body with his back. He used to have his underwear on, and he never took it off. Just his legs and his um, back and shoulders. Now, at some point, Mr. Menendez, did the massages that you were doing on your father change? Yes. And uh, did he, was there an occasion when he asked you to do something new? Yes. And what was it? Would you tell us what it was that he asked you to do? Um, he took off his underwear, and it, uh, he had never done that before. And... Uh, he had me massage the front of him. And yes. so I started, I massaged his calves and his thighs, and, and, I, and I skipped over um, his genitals because I didn't, I didn't want to touch him. And I just went to his stomach, and uh, he said no. And did you understand what he meant? Yes. And what, what happened next? I just touched him. And did anything else happen? after you, you touched his genitals? Yes. And did anything else happen? Yes. What happened? Well, I started to rub him and then he told me to massage him with his mouth. With his mouth? With my mouth. And do you remember whether or not at that point your father had an erection? Yes, he did. And how did you feel about his asking you to massage him with your mouth? I didn't want to do that because I I had never um, I had never seen him like that and I didn't quite I didn't want to do it. Did it frighten you? Did yes. You, did you uh, therefore refuse and that mm -hmm. ended things? No, I I wanted this time to go on with my dad. I didn't want it to end, so I was going to do what he said. I just didn't want to do all things. Did you do what he asked you to do during that session? Yes. And what happened when you tried to do that? I, uh, I gagged. He put his hand on my head and, and he shoved my, my, my head on his, on his penis and it went in too far and I tried to push away and he, he just did it. He tried to be calm about it and be nice but it was just, it was too big and it was too far inside me and I just pulled away. Now, did he get angry or upset with you on that occasion? No. So it was still nice? No, I mean, it was, it, was, it was nice to be with him. I didn't like what I was doing, but I figured that it was just me and then I would get used to it. Uh, I didn't think my dad was doing something wrong. Um, did you think anything that had happened up till then was wrong or unnatural or abnormal or weird or anything like that? No. Did your dad, uh, strike that, excuse me, Your Honor, did your father uh, talk to you about whether what was going on between um, you and, and he was okay or right or normal or historical or anything like that? Yes, he said it was something that was supposed to happen and um, he often referred to ancient times in the Romans and the Greeks and, and how they used to have sex before battle and and talk about how this was natural and this was supposed to happen. And did you, um, now you're about how old now, seven, eight? Uh, I'm in the North Mill house. So you're about seven? Yes. Do you think your father was a real smart guy when you were seven? Yes. Did you feel your father was very knowledgeable? I thought he knew everything. Did you believe everything he told you? Yes. 
And so did you believe that what he told you about this was true? Yes. And did you continue to believe that for a while? I believed that for a long time. Now this, uh, strike that, after the North Mill Road house, the family then moved to Pennington? Yes. And the activities that you've now described, uh, did they continue in the Pennington house? Yes. Did you have a room of your own in the North Mill Road house? Yes. And did you continue to have a room of your own in the Pennington house? Yes. And the activity that you've described so far with your father giving you two kinds of massages and you giving him two kinds of massages, did that continue the same uh, when you were in the Pennington house? Yes, I didn't think of it as two kinds of massages, though. Uh, well, I know I'm calling it that for now, okay? After this occasion when your father um, asked you to do a mouth massage, did he continue to ask you to do massages with your hands? Yes. And were there other episodes of mouth massages where you were doing that for your father? It would be one and the other, one after another. And was he continuing to do the two kinds of massages to you? Yes, he would almost always um, come in my room and do it to me first, and then I would just follow whatever he was doing. So you tried to do to him what he was doing to you? Yes, that's what I did. And at some point, did the nature of these incidents change? Did he either stop doing certain things he had been doing? Did he start doing other things? Did he have you do other things? Uh, yes. Okay, tell me what the change was. He, uh, he started using uh, different tools and wanting me to um, do things to him so that he would show me how and he would do them to me and so on. What do you mean by tools? He had this wooden, uh, it was about this long, and it had a little knob at the end, and it was roundish. And uh, uh, he would tell me to use that on myself, and he would show me how to use it on him, and then he would use it on me. And what part of your body were you supposed to use this thing on? My, uh, my butt. And did this uh, use of this tool continue over a period of time? Only a, a short time until he started uh, showing me how to use uh, my penis. I didn't call it that at the time, but that's what it was. And he started to show you how to use your penis to do something to him? Yes. Uh, All right. Mr. Menendez, do you have some idea of approximately how old you were when your father started uh, showing you how to do something with your yeah, penis? Yeah, I was still swimming. I, uh, I believe I was in fifth grade. Fifth grade? Yeah. So you would have been 10? Yes. And at some point, uh, had he taught you what he wanted you to do to him with your penis? Yes. And was there a period when you were having anal intercourse with your father where you were the person penetrated? Yes. And during this period of time, what was the mood of these incidents with your father? I didn't like what was going on. I thought it was really dirty, and, uh, but the mood was light, and he would show me how to do something and, and talk about it matter-of-factly, and 
and, and talk about how this was normal and this was supposed to be done and like anything else. Was he still being nice? Yes. Now, when, when he... This wooden implement, you said he showed you how to do, use it on him, but you were also supposed to use it on yourself? Yes, he wanted me, he gave me that and uh, another thing to use on myself when, when he wasn't. He was trying to do uh, it to me, but it wasn't working. It, it was. When you say it wasn't working, was it hurting? Yes. So. All right, the objection is overruled as to that question, but counsel, please refrain from asking leading questions. Okay. Um, how did your father react at that stage uh, to things hurting you? Um, he was nice about it. He didn't want to hurt me. Um, so what, what would he do if something was hurting you? Would he continue to do it? Would no, he he'd stop. stop. And did you ever use that wooden thing on yourself when he wasn't around? No. Did you know why he wanted you, did he say why he wanted you to use that thing? Yes. What did he tell you? I don't remember exactly what he told me, but I knew why. It was so that I could practice on myself so that it wouldn't hurt anymore when he did. Now, at some point, did your father stop being nice? Yes. Approximately how old were you? I was uh, 11 years old. It was just after I finished swimming. What do you mean by finished swimming? Uh, swimming had ended. I ended swimming and uh, <coughs> it was started after that point. I don't understand what you mean by you ended swimming. Does that mean you... you swimming had stopped. He had told me that I had to take uh, a certain course in sports. I was either tennis, soccer, swimming, and uh, it was clear that he wanted me to go into tennis like Lyle had. You were supposed to choose a sport? Yes. And you were supposed to choose a sport to compete in from then on? Yes. And you, it could have been swimming? or tennis or soccer? Yes. Was it, was it team sport okay or was it supposed to be an individual sport? No, he wanted me to choose, it was clear he wanted me to choose swimming, I mean uh, tennis, because Lyle had gone into it and he didn't want me to swim anymore. Um, uh, so I chose tennis. That was the impression you got when you chose tennis, that he didn't want you to swim anymore? I just, I just didn't know. I was, it was real confusing. He sat down with me and he, and, he, and he came over to me and he said, what sport do you want to play? You have to choose a sport because I was 11 years old and he said I was becoming a man and it was time to choose a sport. And so I said tennis. Later I found out that he didn't want me to choose tennis, that he wanted me. I, I blame myself. I thought maybe he wanted me to do swimming. But at the time I thought he wanted me to choose tennis because Lyle had gone into it. At the time that you chose the sport, you thought your father wanted you to pick tennis. Is yes. that right? <clears throat> Later on, after something happened, did you think that your father had actually wanted you to choose swimming? Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. Okay. Now, what was it, Mr. Menendez, that happened that made you think that your father was upset with you for having given up swimming? Uh, he wasn't nice anymore during the sex. You have to put the mic in. He the wasn't nice anymore during the sex. Now, do you recall the first time that he wasn't nice during the sex? Yes. Yes. And you were 11? I was 11. The reason you're having trouble is it's not facing you. Face it. Towards I know. I, I, need, I need to use the restroom. I need a break. Okay, we'll take a recess and we'll resume at 3.30, or 2.30, I'm sorry, 2.30, ladies and gentlemen. Don't discuss the case with anyone or form any opinions about it. We'll resume at 2.30. So you may resume your direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Menendez, this particular incident when you were 11, um, do you remember it? Yes, very well. How do you think about this incident in relation to things that happened both before and after? 
I, uh, it's one that just really stands out in my mind. It, is, it, is it one of the worst things that happened to you? Yes. And thinking about it, do you remember what was happening in the house? Anything you heard or saw before this incident actually began? Yes. What was it that was happening? I heard uh, some fighting with my parents downstairs. Who was fighting with your parents? My mom and my dad were fighting. Between themselves? Yes. Was this a physical altercation or a verbal fight? Uh, I didn't know if it was physical. I just heard the verbal. I just heard them yelling at each other. Okay. And what happened after you heard them yelling at each other? I heard my father coming up the stairs. And what house are you in? Pennington. Okay. And um, what happened when your father got up the stairs? He came toward my room. Uh, all I could think about was him coming toward my room and how I was hoping he wasn't going to do that. Do what? Come toward my room. Why? Because I didn't want him to come into my room when he was angry. Even if he was angry at someone else? Yes. Did you think that it was going to be something sexual? No, I didn't think it was going to be something sexual if he was angry at that time. Okay, what did you think was going to happen if he was angry at that time? I thought he was just going to take out the belt or hit me or throw me someplace. I didn't know what was going to happen. Did you know what the topic of the argument was between your mother and father? <laughs> no. Did you have any concerns about what it might have been? Yeah, I, I was concerned that it might have been over me. Had there been arguments in the past over you? Yes. And had any of those arguments in the past over you resulted in your father physically hurting you? Yes, he would get angry with mom and they would yell back and forth and then he'd come to my room and just hit me or whatever. So did you think it was possibly one of those episodes about to occur? Yes, that's what I thought was about to occur. So, if you could tell us what happened, in fact, when he came into your room on this occasion. Uh, he came into the room and he told me to kneel down on my bed. Okay. And, uh, and I did and he, he came over to my bed and threw me off the bed and uh, told me to kneel on the floor. And you I made was, a sweeping motion with your right hand when you said he... Yeah, he just threw me um, with his hand on my arm here. He, he took you by on the arm and threw you off the bed? Yes. And said? And said for me to get on my knees on the floor. And I was real confused because he had just said to get on my knees on the bed. And so I didn't know what to do. What did you think was going to happen when he told you to get on your knees on the bed? I thought it might have been some sort of sex. Why did you think that? Because when he told me to get on my knees in the bed, usually um, what would happen would be for me to have some sort of sex with him, but it was strange because he didn't tell me to take off my clothes. He didn't help me take off my clothes like he used to do. He just told me to kneel on the bed, and I didn't understand why. I didn't know what was going on. So did you then kneel on the floor as he ordered you to do? Yes. And was he dressed? Yes. Okay, what happened? Uh, first of all, did it hurt when he threw you off the bed? I hit my head against the wall, but I wasn't thinking about that. Okay, what happened now? He was unbuckling his pants, um, and he, he pulled out his penis. And uh, in some way, either by his hand on my head or by telling me, he told me he wanted me to um, massage his penis with my mouth. And uh, did you do that? Yes. And you had done that before, hadn't you? Yes. Had you ever done it being on the floor on your knees? No. Mr. Menendez, is this the beginning of what you came to call knees? Yes. And did you call it that because of the position you had to take? Yes. And what happened ultimately in this uh, episode? I had to, I had to give him uh, a massage on my knees and, until he started to uh, have an orgasm. And 
Had he ever done that before while you were giving him a <coughs> mouth massage? No. Um, he he had done it, not just not in my mouth. I was ready to pull away like uh, I'd always done. And, and then he just came on a towel or a sheet, whatever we had with him. So I was about to pull away because I didn't know what was going to happen because we weren't on a bed and I was just kneeling down. And he said, no, swallow. And he held my head to him. And therefore, did he ejaculate in your mouth? Yes. And did he swallow? Partly. Partly. And uh, did this upset you? Yes. And how did you demonstrate being upset? I was crying. And how did he react to your crying? He pushed me away afterwards. And was there, did he say or do anything to you afterwards? Yes. What did he say or do? He said, why can't you just be like your brother? What did that mean? I thought he just meant, why do I have to cry all the time? And was he, um, what was his tone of voice when he said this? He was rough and he was angry. Did he at any time in, at this point use the word embarrassment? Uh, I don't remember him using the word embarrassment. He just started talking about how I wasn't a Menendez and how I was never going to be good enough to be a Menendez and how he was ashamed to have me as his son. And, and then he said, I get used to it and left. And what were you doing while he was saying these things to you? I was just sitting on the floor crying. And after he left, what happened? I went to the door to see if he was still around the corner, and I just went to the bathroom and threw up. Where was the bathroom in relation to your bedroom? It was in the middle of the hall. In the middle between what and what? Between my bedroom and my parents' bedroom. Back up from the mic a little bit. And you threw up in the, in the bathroom on that occasion? Yes. Now, were there other incidents like this one after this incident? Yes, this is what started to happen all the time. He no longer had me on the bed. He no longer had me sit on the bed between his legs. He no longer had me lie down on the bed. It was just on my knees. And in addition to your just being on your knees, was his attitude after this different than it had been? Yes, it changed dramatically. And how was he from then on? He was no longer nice. He now yelled at me all the time. He forced me to do things. I had to do whatever he said, and it didn't matter if I complained or if I said no or if I said please stop. He didn't stop. He just, he, he completely changed. And when other episodes like this would occur, uh, did you ever throw up after those? Yes, I threw up almost every time when he, when he would come in my mouth. Now, how far away from your parents' bedroom was this bathroom where you were throwing up? Eight feet, ten feet. And your mother, Mr. Menendez, when you were in the bathroom throwing up because of what your father had done, did your mother ever come to you? No. Were there times up until this point in your life, 11 years old, when you had been ill and thrown up? Yes. And had you thrown up in that very same bathroom? Yes. And when you were ill and threw up, did your mother come in the bathroom? Yes. Did she make inquiry? Yes, she asked me what was wrong. At any time, Mr. Menendez, from this point on, when you were in that bathroom, throwing up, because of sex with your father, did your mother ever come in? No. Now, after this incident at 11, did your mother begin to do something peculiar with respect to your body? No, it wasn't right after that incident. It was, it was much later. How much later? <sighs> Almost a year. Um, it was when other stuff started to happen. <laughs> What kind of other stuff was happening, just generically? Uh, actual sex. Intercourse? Yes. And it was after that started to happen that your mother started to do something to you? Yes. And what was it that your mother started to do? She would ask me to sit on the bed and um, take down my pants so she could examine me. Examine you where? 
in my genitals. She, she, she called it checking me out. She would say, let me check you out. And I would sit down on the bed and she would look at my penis. Would she, um, did she tell you why she was checking you out? She just said to see if there was anything wrong. She didn't give me any details about why. And were there times when there was something unusual? Yes. Okay. And what were these unusual things? I would just have a, um, small blisters uh, on my penis. And would your mother do anything about that? Yes. What did she do? She used to squeeze them and pop them. And did she ever ask you where they were coming from? No. And did she ever tell you what they were? No. And she at that point, as strike that, you've testified that around 10, your father had taught you to have anal sex with him, correct? He taught me how to do it, yes. Yes. And at this point, when your mother is checking you out, is that still happening? Very infrequently. Does your mother continue to check you out for several years? Yeah, all the way up until we moved to uh, California. And is there some other types of activities with your father that begin during the period that she's checking you out? Yes. And are those the things you came to call rough sex? Actually, I was referring to nice sex. Okay, but was there also rough sex happening during that time? Yes. And did rough sex involve your father hurting you with things? Yes. And what kind of things was he hurting you with? Uh, needles, pins, tacks. What was he doing with the Rope. needles? Excuse me? Rope. What was he doing with the needles and the pins and the tacks, generally? He was sticking them into my thighs and my butt. Was he doing anything to your penis? Yes. What was he doing? Sometimes he'd be um, giving me oral sex, and sometimes he would have just um, tied up my penis. Back up. Tied it up with the rope? Yes. And would that hurt? Yes, very much so. And when that, those activities were going on, was your mother still checking you out? Yes. Now, your father, during the years that you lived in Pennington, was an executive with the RCA Corporation, was he not? Yes. And was he uh, traveling a lot? Yes, he was traveling uh, almost every week. At least he was in New York, away from the house almost every week. Well, was he away for the whole week, or was he away at least part of each week? Part of each week. Was he a very busy person? Yes. And did he talk about how important and busy he was at work? Yes, he'd talk about his work, not during these sessions, but uh, uh, at home at other times. At any time, Mr. Menendez, when you were alone with your father in your room, when any of these sexual things would happen, would your mother ever come and say, Jose, you have a phone call, or anything like that. No. Did your father spend a lot of time on the phone with business other than when he was in your room? Yes. And would he receive a lot of phone calls at the house? Yes. Mr. Menendez, during these years when you were living in Pennington and these things were happening, did you think your mother knew what was going on? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Were there times when, following one of these episodes with your father, you'd be crying? Yes. Did your mother ever come upon you when you were crying? Uh, sometimes after these, I'd have to go downstairs to dinner. Um, or afterwards, and she would come when she'd see me crying, and, uh, Did yes. she ever ask you, Eric, what are you crying about? No. Would she ask you that sometimes if you were crying and it had nothing to do with sex with your father? 
sometimes, uh, but often when I was crying, it was apparent why I was crying. Well, what do you mean? Well, I would be crying at the swimming pool, or I'd be crying coming from school, and then she'd ask me what was wrong. But if it was from sports or just from coming out of my room, she would I don't understand what you mean from sports. I don't, I, perhaps I didn't understand your If it was from swimming or if it was uh, from tennis, almost never when I was playing soccer, I, I don't think I cried, but um, if it was from sports and she was there and I she came knew. in. Yes. Okay. What I'm saying is, were there times that you would be crying when she didn't know what caused it and she would ask you? Yes. Did she ever ask you why you were crying when it followed one of these episodes with your father? No. And what would she say, if anything, to you when you were crying following these episodes with your father? She would say, do what I told you to do. What did you tell, what had she told you to do? She, she taught me how to hide my tears and to uh, not cry. And if I was crying, she taught me how to get rid of the tears make it seem like I hadn't been crying. And what was the method? She had, uh, she had water that she would tell me to uh, put in my eyes, otherwise she had this little special thing that she would keep in my bathroom to put in my eyes. What was this little special thing? I'm not sure what it was. It was in a little uh, plastic container. And she put it in your eyes? She taught me how to. So you'd put it in your eyes? Yes. These episodes with your father, what time of day did they usually occur? At night. Before or after dinner? Either before or after. Usually before when he, when he right got home from work, but sometimes it would happen after. If it were before dinner, would you still be expected to come down to dinner? Yes, unless I was unable to. And were there times when you were unable to eat dinner? There were times when I was unable to come down to dinner. Why was that? Because I was crying too much or I was too much of a mess and I was shaking and I couldn't uh, I couldn't come down to dinner. I used to get these these pounding headaches um, sort of like sears through my brain and my dad would say you're not going down to dinner. Were you usually however expected to go down to dinner after one of these episodes? Yes. And would that be why you would dry your tears or put water in your eyes? Yes, um, a lot of times. Sometimes not. Sometimes I would go down to dinner uh, with my eyes red. And what would happen? How did your father react to that? He didn't like it, and uh, sometimes he would cope with it, and he just wouldn't talk to me. I was usually ignored at dinner anyway, but this time he, he really wouldn't talk to me. Now, if we could go back... After this incident that you've described when you were 11, um, did your ideas about these times alone with your father change? Of course, I don't, I don't understand exactly what you're saying. Okay, what did you think of what was going on at that point when your father got violent when you were 11? I thought he was just angry at me. I learned that he actually just wasn't angry at me, but at the time I thought he was just angry at me. And what did you think he was angry about? What had you done? I wasn't sure at first. Later on, I figured that maybe he really wanted me to choose swimming. And since that was his sport when he was growing up, and he was just doing this to get back at me. So that's what you seized upon? You thought, oh, it must be because I gave up swimming? Yes. His anger, however, in these episodes, you said, went on for a long time. Yes. Did you think you were doing anything else wrong? That would make him angry with you this way. I thought I must have been doing something wrong, and I didn't know what. So I just tried to do everything right. I tried to be perfect in school. I tried to be perfect in tennis. But I didn't know uh, what I, exactly I was doing wrong. He didn't tell me. And did the fact that these kinds of episodes were now happening um, change the way you felt about your life? Of course. What, what do you, what, how do you mean change? Did you get depressed? Yes, I got very depressed and uh, I just had trouble concentrating in school. I just had trouble dealing with it. And Really, I had trouble dealing with the fact that my father no longer loved me. Um, 
more than anything else. But it was because it was, when it got painful, it was harder. But when it was just giving him massages, it was just because he didn't love me. I don't understand. What do you mean when you were just giving him massages? Before anything really painful started to happen, it was, I felt very depressed and very lonely because I lost my dad's love and I didn't understand why I did that. Um, but after it got painful, um, then I started just wanting it to end and not, not really caring so much about dad's love as much. Now, when it got painful, is that what we were talking about? Is that the rough sex stuff? Yes. And how old were you when that started? I was 13. And how long did that go on? Until we moved to Princeton. Until we moved to Princeton. Okay. And you moved to Princeton when you were 15 and a half? Yes. Now, before the rough sex started, the thing that you talked about with the tax and such, was there yet another, well, oh, strike that, let me back up. You said at some point your father had anal sex with you. Is that right? Yes. And how old do you believe you were when that happened? I was in sixth grade. I guess, I, I'm pretty sure I was 12. And was that within a year of the episode you previously described at 11? Yes. Now, you've mentioned earlier that um, he had made some efforts to accomplish anal intercourse with you that had been unsuccessful because it hurt you? Yes. And therefore he had stopped? Yes. And that was before the incident when you were 11 when he was violent, is that right? Yes. Now, the, when you were 12, do you recall the day that he succeeded? Yes. And was that a gentle process or not? No, not at all. What was it, Mr. Menendez? It was very, very painful. And do you know if on that occasion anyone else was in the home besides yourself and your father? No, I was alone in, in, in the house with my dad. Now, was there a part of your bed that was removable? Yes. And what was that part? It was a wooden slat that there were many of them under my bed, but um, he had taken one off and left it off. He being whom? My father. And when had he done that, removed one and left it off? Early on. I don't know what that means. Early on, when I was, I guess I was, before anything bad started to happen. It must before have been nine you were 11? Yes. But you were living in Pennington? Yes. And what would he do with the slat that he took off from the bed? He would wedge it underneath the door, under the doorknob, high on the carpet. So that no one could open the door from the outside? Yes. And I think you've already said your mother never came to the door anyway. No. So do you, did you have in mind at the time who that slat was supposed to keep out? Well, I thought it was to keep out anyone from coming in the room. It just happened that no one came to the room ever, but I didn't, I didn't know. Who were the candidates? Who were the other people who lived in this house? My mother and my brother, uh, and at some time, Diane. When Diane lived with you? Yes. Now, on this particular occasion, nobody else is home? No. No? We're no one else is home. Okay. And do you recall basically what happened? Yes. <coughs> basically what happened? Well, my dad came in and told me to take off my clothes and uh, to kneel on the bed. And he closed the blinds and he put the slat underneath the door like he always did. And uh, they told me to bend over the footboard. This bed had a footboard and a headboard? Yes. And 
Did you know what it meant to be told to bend over the footboard? Yes. He had had you do that before? Yes. That's when he tried to have sex with me, but wasn't able to. And did your father put anything on you or ask you to put anything on you? This time, he just did it himself. Usually, he, he told me to. What was it that was put on you? He had a Vaseline jar. And in the past, when he had tried to do this, he had had you put the Vaseline on? Yes, he put some on um, himself, and he put had me put them on myself. On this occasion, he put it on you? Yes. And what happened? And uh, he's, he, he lined himself up, and he started going into me like he had always done, but this time he was going in too far. And I said, Dad, please, please stop. And I said, Dad, you're hurting me. And he would just kept on going further. At one point, I just started screaming, and I started saying, stop, it hurts, it hurts. And uh, he just went all the way in. And did that hurt? Yes. And how did you react to that pain? I just sort of died off. I didn't, uh, I stopped screaming, and I just sort of left myself. You left yourself? I just pretended that it wasn't happening. I pretended that the pain wasn't happening, and I just, I just went away in my mind. Uh, it was too painful. When it was over, did you cry? I was crying during it. Okay. And after it was over, were you still crying? Yes. And did your father say anything to you at that time? Yeah, he had a towel on the bed, and he put the towel on the bed, and he had me sit on the towel so that I wouldn't get anything on the bed. And he said uh, very calmly and looked at me and uh, told me to look him in the eyes, and he said, next time you ever scream or yell, I'm going to beat you so bad you'll never be able to scream or yell again. Do you, uh, did it occur to you, did something occur to you about this episode? concerning why he had uh, gone ahead when you were in pain? Yes. What was that? It was because uh, when I had screamed or yelled or cried out before, he had told me that if I ever did that, he was going to go all the way inside of me. That was on a previous occasion when he was trying to do this? Yes. So he kept his word? Yes. Did you believe, Mr. Menendez, as you were growing up, that your father was a person who would make good on his threats? Oh, yes. Now, did, uh, did your father, in this particular conversation after this episode, um, strike that. Your father said to you that, that if you scream again, he'll make sure he hits you hard enough that you won't be able to cry or scream again? Yes. And did he explain to you whose fault that would be? Yes, he asked me whose fault it would be. He asked me if I understood, and I said yes. And he said, so if I ever do that, do you understand whose fault it'll be, or, or do you know why it will happen? And I said yes. Okay. And what did you, whose fault would it be? He made it very clear that it would be my fault. And I understood that it would. What did you do, uh, if anything, after this episode? Well, did your father leave after he had told you it would be your fault? Yes, he left and he closed the door. And when he told you this about whose fault it would be, what kind of mood was he in? He was in a very stern, very serious, uh, very strong um, mood. And what did you do after he had left? I sort of waited outside uh, the door in my bedroom, uh, listening to see where he had gone, and then just went to my bathroom and got in the tub. Took a bath? I took a hot bath and just promised myself to do whatever he wanted, never to scream, never to yell, never to cry. Just do what he wanted when it happened. Now, over the preceding uh, couple of years, talking about now you're, you're 12 when this happened, is that right? Yes. Over the previous couple of years, um, had, in the incidents with your father, had the talking stopped? Oh, yes. No, he told me that he didn't want me to say a word when he spoke, and he talked about silence. When, when he talked, 
he would talk, but he would never want me to say a word unless he spoke to me. And when he talked, he would give me lectures about silence, about the Romans, about the Greeks. He would, he would lecture me about different things. During the sex or during the visits that included sex? Is Either that while I was getting dressed or while I was undressing, um, sometimes in the middle, but usually not. And were you allowed to talk? No, not unless I, I uh, was asked a question. And did silence become the pattern? Yes, he told me all about silence. What about silence, Mr. Menendez? What did he tell you? He told me that silence was the greatest thing that man had. Uh, he said that it was the greatest power that anyone could achieve and that with silence you could control anyone. And was there a time then when the sexual episodes with your father were totally and completely silent? Yes. When he would say nothing whatsoever? Yes, then it would be silent. And you would say nothing whatsoever? Yes. Now, was there, was there a time when se the sexual incidents that you have called nice sex began? Yes. How old were you when that happened? I, I believe it was just after sixth grade. I know it was before seventh grade, um, but I believe it was just before uh, the ending of sixth grade or in the spring or right before the summer. I know Diane was there, so it had to be right around that period. Now, why, Mr. Menendez, did you come to label uh, these incidents nice sex? Because of how bad the rough sex was. Okay. So by comparison, these were nice? Yes. And were these incidents different than knees? Yes, completely different. Okay. What was different about this? And you don't have to describe everything that was done here, okay? Just the general feeling of it. What was different about this than knees? It wasn't violence. He wouldn't come in and have nice sex when he was in a bad mood. He would always do it when he wanted to relax, when he had a, a tough day at work, he said, and he just wanted to be comfortable with me, he would come in and have this with me. And did this involve a variety of sexual activities? Yes. That he required you to do to him? Objection. Could you characterize in two sentences, perhaps, what was involved in these episodes of nice sex? You don't have to give details. You don't want to give the details of this, do you? It just had me giving him massages with my mouth, him giving me massages with his mouth, and my testicles and my butt, and uh, so on. Okay. And he wouldn't be angry or violent during these? No. Now, rough sex, oh, strike that. With these episodes called nice sex, um, take longer or less time than, say, knees? Took a lot longer. How did you feel about these episodes? I, 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 I liked knees better because it was short and he would just come in and sometimes he'd have me make me swallow and sometimes he wouldn't. And, and I really didn't like that at all, but it was short and I wouldn't have to put up with a lot of long drawn out things. Okay. And nice sex was longer and long drawn out things? Yes. And rough sex, did it seem to be related in some way to one of the other types? It seemed to be related to the nice sex, but it was different. And what was different about rough sex? It was very strange. Um, it was very dark. Um, he turned off the lights, he put candles around the bed and on my nightstand and on my dressers and he would light them and he would put the candles in cups, um, you know, the cups that he would bring from the kitchen or different plates that were in my bedroom. And it would be very dark and it would be very quiet and he would do these things to me. And was that when he was doing things with uh, tacks and such? Have you told us already about some of the things he would do? Yes. Mr. Menendez, before this set of episodes called Rough Sex began, 
Did your father announce to you something about pain training? Yes, he did. And could you tell us about that? He told me that I was the biggest sissy and the biggest coward he had ever seen in his entire life and that he was ashamed to have me as a son because I couldn't take the pain and I couldn't be brave um, from what he had seen. What was he referring to? Do you know? He was referring to a shot I got in the doctor's office um, when, uh, when I was in this doctor's office and he was there. The doctor had pulled out this needle and I was real calm and I was real relaxed until he stuck it in me and I was screaming and crying and, and really crying out um, to the point where I had to go out the back door uh, of the office. And uh, Why'd you have to go out the back door of the office? Because I was embarrassed, but he was so embarrassed that he could not leave and go into a group of people who were in the doctor's um, office waiting room. Who's he? Who was embarrassed? My father. Okay. So you were crying and he didn't want to walk you through the waiting room because you were crying? No, he didn't want to walk through the waiting room because I had been screaming in the doctor's office. Okay. Were you still screaming? No. He just didn't want anybody to know who was the screaming kid? Yes. Okay. And after this, he made this announcement to you about your being sissy and coward? Yes. And, and he, what did he tell you he was going to do about that, if anything? He told me that he was going to train me how not to, not to feel pain, not to have to uh, feel the hurt of the pain, and that he was going to eliminate that from my uh, senses, my feelings. And how uh, did he then demonstrate to you how he was going to do that? He did that. Would you back up from the mic a little bit? Thank you. And would you tell us, how did he do that? He would stick things in me as he was giving me oral sex, or at times he would just sit on the bed with his legs up uh, um, spread and with his back to the, to the back of the bed, and he would have me give him oral, me oral sex, and he would stick the needles or the tacks into my thighs uh, as he was doing this. Did he also use a knife at any time during, and, and these were the incidents that you've come to call rough sex? Yes. And did he also use a knife at any time? Yes, he would. Uh, he had this wooden kitchen knife that he would use to just, he wouldn't be doing anything with sex at that point though. He would just have me sit on the back of the bed, he would put a towel under my legs, and he would just cut my, my thighs with the knife. And have you, do you have a, a scar that you, is still visible on your thigh from what he, when he did that? Yes. Which thigh is it? My left thigh. And how long is this? It's not really my thigh. It's my right on the side of my knee. On the side of your knee? Yeah, right at the bottom of my thigh. And how long is this scar? It's about that long. And you recall that that's something that was done during one of these episodes? Yes. Was there something, Mr. Menendez, that you called the mirror? Yes. And what was the mirror? The mirror um, would happen a lot after sex. Um, sometimes it would just happen after I played tennis or just when he got home and wanted to know how I practiced. It so was. It was a... It was a circular mirror with, it was like a sailing mirror. It, it had, it looked like a, a sailor's port and it had sticks coming out the side of it, like 12 sticks around the mirror. And Wait, it, it looked like a, um, a it had wheel rungs. of a ship? I, yes, that's exactly what it looked like. Okay, it was a round mirror? Yes. That looked like a ship's wheel? Yes. Okay, and where was it? What room was it in? It was in my room on my, um, not my nightstand, the, the dresser, um, right across from my bed. That's what it's called. It was in your bedroom. Was it mounted on the wall or was it sitting on the dresser? It was just sitting on the dresser, leaning up against the wall. And what did the mirror have to do with your father? Well, strike this. He would be drilling you, asking you questions. Yes. What the mirror have to do with his asking you questions? Well, he would take my chair. I had a wooden ch chair, and um, uh, he would take it and he would put it in front of the mirror, or he would have me stand up in the mirror. If it was after sex, I'd be doing it naked. If it was after tennis, I'd have my tennis clothes on. And he'd walk around behind me and ask me questions. What kinds of questions? He would say, 
how did you feel today when you were on the tennis court? Did you feel you did well? And what would you say? I would give my answer. Well, hypothetically, give an answer so we can hear how this would go. I would say, yeah, I, I think I played well. And he would say, wrong. And now what was supposed to happen, if uh, anything, when, you, when he said, wrong? I'd have to hit myself in the head. You'd have to hit yourself? Yes. Without hitting yourself, would you just show us what you were supposed to do? But don't hit yourself. I'd have to go like this. Okay. And what would happen if you didn't go like this? Well, it wasn't like this. I'd have to hit myself. I understand that. You'd have to hit yourself. And what if you didn't hit yourself hard enough, or if you didn't do it, or if you missed? What would happen? He'd hit me. And where would he hit you? In the back of the head. And how long would these question sessions in front of the mirror go on? Half hour. And how many wrongs Not sure. typically would you hear? I would hear, it depended on how stubborn it. There were times when I just couldn't take it anymore. It would just well up inside of me and I just, I couldn't stand it. And I knew the answer he would want after a while. I, I knew that if I was on the tennis court, he'd say, how, how did you play in tennis today? And I'd say, badly. And he'd say, right. And he'd say, how did you hit your forehand? I'd say, terribly. And he'd say, right. And he'd, and, I, and, and he'd say, did you hit it down the line like I told you to? No. And he'd say, right. But uh, sometimes he'd trick me once he knew that I was catching on to him. And sometimes I would just give the, the, the wrong answer on purpose. Would you give a truthful answer? In other words, if you thought you played well, would you sometimes say, I played well? Sometimes I would say I played well, but I knew I'd get punished for that. You knew he'd say wrong? Yes. But you did it anyway? Yes. Because you had played well. I had played well, and that wasn't really the reason. I just needed to defy him in any way I could. Okay. And what would be the result of that kind of defiance? I'd hit myself. And how often would the mirror occur? At least every week. Sometimes more. It really depended. It would usually happen on a Saturday and Sunday after I played tennis or one time during the week after a, 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 any sort of a sex massage. It depended. Mr. Menendez, could you please sit back for a second? Take a breath and see if you can stay back there. Okay? Yes. Now, you heard your brother Lyle testify that there were many, many occasions in his life when your father would take him to some part of the house and they would sit down for hours at a time and your father would lecture or drill your brother. You heard that testimony? Yes. Did your father ever take you to some part of the house other than your bedroom and give you similar lectures and drills to what he did to Lyle? No, it would only be the mirror. <coughs> it would only be? It would only be the mirror. So the mirror was what he did to talk to you? Yes. And what about the dinner table? You heard your brother describe what he was put through at the dinner table. Do you recall that? Yes. And did that sound right to you? Is that what you recall happening at the dinner table to your brother? Yeah, it, it was much worse than he described, but it was, it was bad. Much worse for him? Yes. And was it ever that bad for you at the dinner table as it was for him? No. Did your father do the same kind of questioning of you in front of the mirror that he did of your brother at dinner? Yes. Do you remember your father ever making Lyle smack himself uh, for giving wrong answers at dinner? No. Your Honor, could we have a break at this point? All right, we'll take a recess. We'll resume at 20 minutes to the hour. Don't discuss with the direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Menendez, can you look to your right to the pictures of yourself that are on that board? Uh-huh. Can you see them? Yes. How old were you in those pictures? I think I was 10 or 11. Do no, wait, appear, that's Hershey. You appear to be playing tennis in the one on the bottom. Yeah, that's you know? Hershey. It's got to be 
12 or uh, it's got to be 11 or 12 because Hershey didn't start till I was 11. I think that was the first time I ever played in Hershey. So at the time those photographs of you were taken, you had already been raped by your father, had you not? Yes. And following that, did you make an effort to run away? Yes. And did that occur at what time of year? In the summer. And was this a time when someone <coughs> was visiting with your family for the summer? A relative? Well, she was visiting more than just for the summer. Okay. Who was visiting? Diane. And how did you try to run away? I just went across the lake uh, in a canoe and uh, decided to, to leave. Did you pack up some things? I had a lunchbox and I had a little um, uh, school book sack that I put some clothes in and I filled the lunchbox with food. And, and did, uh, uh, did you get away? I got away uh, uh, for the all afternoon uh, until nighttime when it started to get real dark and there was a, was a forest across the, uh, not across the street, across the lake. And uh, it was a real heavy, dense forest and you could get lost and I did. And uh, did somebody find you in the forest? Yes, I heard my father calling after me. And did he find you? Yeah, I called after him. Why'd you do that if you were trying to run away? At that point, I was much more scared of being in the forest at night than running away. And what happened? Um, did your father eventually come upon you? Yes. And uh, what was his reaction? He was furious. And uh, did he do anything to you? Yes, he picked me up. I was sitting on the back of a tree. Well, my back was to the tree, and I was sitting on the ground of it. And he picked me up and threw me against the tree and said, if you ever run away, I'll kill you. Do you understand me? You'll never get away. And he just went on and on and on about how this was stupid and how this was ridiculous and how I was embarrassing him. And, and embarrassing I, him to whom? Diane Vandermolen was in the house at the time, and he was, he was more embarrassed that I had done this and Diane would now realize that I tried to get away from the house than anything else. Um, Overall, overall. Yes, we'll stay. Okay. Now, um, at this point in your life, after this effort to run away, did you resolve somehow to change something about the way you were dealing with your father? Yeah. W and what was your res resolution? I, I decided to, uh, to try to do something. I didn't know what to do. I thought about, I thought about killing myself, really. And... Uh, and once I failed at that, I, I tried to, uh, to just try to resist him in some way. What do you mean you failed at killing yourself? Had you tried to kill yourself? Yes. What had you done? I had just filled up the bathtub with water and broken over one of my dad's razors and just sat there looking at the razor in the water. But I wasn't able to do it. Did your dad have straight razors? Yes. Did no, what, what do you mean by straight razors? He had the ones that you... So when you say you broke open a razor, you mean a razor blade? Yeah. Oh, okay. He had one of those, like, six packs where you would throw out the blade and put in another blade. Double-edged blade? Yes. Did you cut yourself? No. What had you resolved to do by way of fighting back? I didn't really know what to do. Um, what did you do? I hid from him. I, uh, I put cinnamon in uh, his drinks and his coffee and his tea. Why did you put cinnamon in his drinks? Well, at the time, uh, I was in seventh grade, and I had a group of kids, uh, friends of mine, that were really involved. Now, they weren't involved, but they talked a lot about sex, and it made me very uncomfortable. Um, so I would sort of shy away and just listen. And and what did you hear that led to putting cinnamon in your father's drinks, if anything? I heard that it uh, made it taste better. It made what taste better? Uh, his semen. And so you did it so it would taste better? Yes. Now, was it at some point after you were 11 years old that you developed a rather peculiar eating habit? Yes. Well, did you think it was peculiar? No. Okay. That's my word? 
Yes. What did you do? I, uh, I used a lot of lemon in my food. And what do you mean by used a lot of lemon? What are we talking about here? Well, in essence, I would put the lemon in the bowl first and then put whatever I was going to put in the bowl, um, like fish or rice or whatever. Sometimes I'd just pour the lemon over the food if it was already on the plate. But otherwise, I would, I would just drown my food in lemon. All of your food? Soup, the meat, chicken. The fish, the rice, uh, pretty much uh, everything. So would you consume a large quantity of lemon every week? Every day. And when you were eating all this lemon, did you notice it had any effect on your sense of taste? Yes. What would happen? Uh, I wouldn't taste as much. You wouldn't taste as much of your food? I did it for a specific purpose, but uh, it didn't. It didn't seem to work all that well. What was the purpose for which you were doing it? So that I wouldn't have to taste um, uh, my dad's. Uh, okay. Uh, let me ask you something. Where did the lemon come from? Did you go and buy it for yourself? The idea. Where did the idea come from? No, or no. Where did the actual lemon that you're putting on everything come from? Oh, from my mother. And would your mother, uh, did she ever run out of lemon? Yes. And would she be concerned about that? Yes. So did she make it a point of trying to always keep you supplied with lemon? She kept stocks of lemon. Did your mother ever ask you why you were drowning all of your food in lemon? No, it was a big joke in the family um, and the relatives and so on, but no one ever asked me why. She never asked you why? No. Overall. Mr. Menendez, was there something about your father's demeanor or look during what you've called rough sex that was hmm. distinctive? Yes. And could you tell us what that was? It was the look in his eyes. It was the way he would, he would look at me, um, through me, past me. Uh, he would, I remember one, at one time, he, he stuck me with a tack, and it really went far into me, and I sort of went, mm. and he just twisted his head around and looked right through me, and it's, it was scary. Was that different than the way he looked at you when he was angry or when other kinds of sexual activity were going on? Yes. It was, a, it was, a, it was like a glazed look. It was, uh, it was as if... It was as if he wasn't there. It was as if he was, or didn't think I was there. It was really, it was really scary because I didn't know what he would do. Because it's it's hard to describe. And on all the other occasions, he was just angry, or he was nice. He was there. He was all there, and he was very bright. And and I would sort of, I would sort of know what what he was uh, thinking. But in this on, time... Yeah. On these occasions, could you know what he was thinking? I had no idea what he was thinking. And why was that particularly scary? Because of what he was doing. Did you think on these occasions that he saw you differently? In other words... I didn't even know if he saw me uh, when he was in the middle of it. It just was, was really weird. Okay. Now, you've testified that this uh, rough sex uh, ended when the family moved to the house in Princeton? Yes. Do you know why it ended? No. And a few months after the family moved uh, to Princeton, did the family move again to California? Yes. And was there something unusual with respect to uh, your father and his molesting you? that occurred after the family moved to California? Well, it ended. It, it ended or it stopped for a while? I had thought it ended, period. It turned out it didn't, but that's what I thought had happened. I thought it was because we moved to California. I was really excited about moving to California and getting out of the, the, the Princeton house, which was very, it was a very depressing, sad house. And, and my mom was in that same state as well during that time. Um, during, well, I don't understand you. Your mom was in what state? She was very depressed, very sad. During what time? In Princeton. 
Could you back up from the mic? Just, just ignore it and stay back. We'll hear you. Um, so you thought California, the move to California was going to be what? I thought it was going to be like a new beginning. I thought it was going to be, it was going to change everything. And you thought it was going to change the sex? Yes. And the first, for how long in California, when you first got here, was there this stopping, this no sex with your dad? Do you understand the question? For about three and a half months. When we, once we were in California, um, for about three and a half months. You sure it was three and a half and not six, Mr. Menendez? Well, it, it was six in total from when we were in Princeton, too, but just in California, it was three and a half months. So there was about two and a half months in Princeton. There was no sex at all in the Princeton house? There was sex. I, I know there was because I remember kneeling on the wooden floor, and uh, the wooden floor was in my bedroom, but I don't remember uh, very well about the Princeton house. Okay, so was there a period when there was no sex in the Princeton house before you moved to California? Yes. Let me ask you this. Starting at the age of six and up until the point when the family moved to California, generally speaking, on average, how many sexual contacts a month was there between you and your father? I didn't hear the first part of the question. All right. Between the time you were six, when it began, and the time that you were 15 and a half, moved to California, mm -hmm. on average, generally over that whole period, how many sexual contacts a month were there between yourself and your father? Two to four times a month. I mean, that's really general. So would there be some months when there'd be nothing? Yes. And would there be some months when there'd be a lot more? No. Well, so it would be some months there would be four uh, times. Sometimes he'd come in every week. He'd come in every week, sometimes for a period of five weeks, and then not come in my room for two months. Okay, so we're trying to average it out, stretch it across that whole period. Yeah. Two to four times a month. Yes. So you get to California, and for the first three and a half months, nothing? Yes, nothing. So what do you think? I think that it was going to end. I thought it was because we moved to California and because I guess I was getting older and, and that it was going to end. How did really, that make you feel? It felt great. I really, I really had a good three and a half months when I was there. How was your mother doing in those three and a half months, the first three and a half months in California? She wasn't doing so well. Now, were you hearing things between your parents during these first months in California uh, that was unlike anything you had heard them argue about in the past? Well, I heard them talk about divorce. And did you hear them talk about affair? Oh, yes. I heard them talk about that in the car, basically through my mom. I heard them. Okay. The question is, you're in California. Are you hearing these kinds of talks the first few months in California? Yes. Had you heard these kinds of talks about divorce, about affairs in New Jersey? No. And is your mother upset? Oh, yes. She was very upset. Was there a period of time when you first moved to California where your mother did a lot of crying? She did almost. Sustained. The answer is true. Can you describe something that your mother was doing when you first came to California that was different than what she did in New Jersey? Well, in, uh, in the Princeton house, she began to do a lot of crying, and I didn't know what it was from until I moved to California. And she did nothing but cry. And it was really sad. Um, and I would try to go talk to her, and she would say, leave me alone. I don't want to talk to you. And she would just stay in her bedroom and cry. Where? Well, at first we were in the Oakwood Apartments. What state, Mr. Menendez? California. And you said she'd do nothing but cry. Are you talking about after you moved to California? Yes and no. I mean, she did a lot of crying in the Princeton house. Um, I just didn't know what it was for. But when, once we got to California, it was all crying. Okay. And how did that make you feel? It made me feel very sad for her. But your and life was somewhat better at that point? My life was great because the sex had ended. And uh, I, was, I wasn't happy with my father, but um, I was happy, really, really happy that the sex had ended. You weren't happy with your father because of what? Because of the way he was dealing with my mother.
Now, at some point, did this uh, stoppage, or did this period where there was no sex with your father end? Yes. And do you remember when that was? It was right before my birthday in uh, 1980, I guess it was 1986. And your birthday is when? November 27th. And Mr. Menendez, when did the family move to California? In August. Of 1986? Yes. And without getting into the details, what form of sexual contact did you have with your father right before your birthday in 1986? Knees. And was knees the most frequent form of sexual contact over the years from 11 on? I, yes, uh, much more so in California, but, uh, but yes, in, uh, in New Jersey, I'd have to say it was the most frequent that I remember. And did knees remain the most frequent form of contact for the years that you lived in California? Yes. And had what you call sex been the least frequent form of contact when you were living in New Jersey? Yes. And did sex continue to be the least frequent form when you lived in California? Oh, yes. I want to uh, ask you to go to an incident, however, of sex that uh, involved your father using a knife. We've, you've referred to this before. Remember that? Yes. Okay. First, can you tell us how old you were when that occurred? I was 17. And where were you living? In the Calabasas house. And your brother, was, was he even in California at that time? If you remember. I don't really remember if he was. I think he may have been. Did you sure. have your own suite of rooms in the Calabasas house? I had two rooms. Yes, you did? Yes. And did this incident with your father start out with him having a knife, or did the knife evolve? It didn't start out with him having a knife. Okay. How did it start out? It started out with him coming in my bedroom and telling me to get on my knees. I was on the bed at the time. And that was fairly common, wasn't it? Yes. And uh, did you do it? No. What did you do? I, I got up, and as I was getting up, I said no. And did you give him a reason for saying no? No, I just said no. Did you say you had a headache? I don't remember saying I had a headache. Do you remember telling me in the past that you thought you told him you had a headache then? What I remember now is all I remember. Okay. So you just said no. Do you know why you said no? Yes. Why did you say no? Because I had been building myself up for a long time before then. Uh, I'd really been building myself up to, 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 to resist him in some way or, or fight back. I, I really hated myself at the time and I, I disliked who I was. And so I just had to, I wanted to do more than say no, but all I could do was say no. Okay, so you said no because you had been planning on saying no. Is that the answer? Yes. All right. And how did he react to your saying no? Oh, well, he hit me and threw me on the bed. Okay. And after he did that, what did he do? He left the room. And what did you think when he left the room? I didn't know. Did you think your resistance had worked at that point? No, because he stormed out of that room. So what happened next? He came back with the knife. Now, this knife, Mr. Menendez, is a small, medium, large? I think it's like that. It's yeah. not bigger. I mean, I remember it being huge. Okay. And where was it kept at that house? It was in my parents' bedroom. And when he came back with the knife, what did he do with it, if anything? He put it on my neck. He put his hand on my head and put the knife on my neck. And did he hurt you with it? No. Did he threaten you with it? Yes. What did he say? He said, I should kill you, and next time I will. And did you believe him? Yes. And following that, did he then... Um, 
demand an act of sex from you. Your Honor, may we approach? Did he then demand something from you? Yes. What? Sex. And did you comply? Yes. Did you complain? No. Did you resist? No. Did you say no? No. Did you just do it? Yes. And had he on this occasion uh, requested that you go into a particular position that was unusual? Yes. And what was unusual about it? It was that I, uh, I put my knees on the uh, edge of the bed. Well, hadn't he asked you to do that before? Yes, but it was unusual. It never, it only happened three times in my life. Was there a mirror in this room, Mr. Menendez? Yes. And were you positioned in some way with respect to the mirror? Yes. And is that what was unusual about this as well? That only happened twice in my life. Well, was this one of the times that happened? Yes. And did he make you look? Yes. And how did you feel about that experience afterwards? I, uh, I really uh, hated myself. And did you feel that you would be resisting him again in the future? No. Was there a thought that would go through your mind when your father was having sex with you concerning dying? Yes. What was that thought? And I'm focusing now on when you were in California, when you were a teenager. I just wanted more than anything else uh, that when I died that no one would find out that this was happening to me. When these sexual things were happening with your father, did you think that you might die? Yes. Did you understand how or why? No, I, I just felt like I was going to die. I, it just was so horrible that I just, I wanted to die and I felt like I was going to die. I just didn't want to die with anyone knowing. You didn't want to die in the middle of it? No. Is that what you meant? Yes. Uh, I, I definitely uh, did not want to die in the middle of it. And if you had died in the middle of it, what might happen? People would know. People would know what? That I was having sex with my father. Did any of that thought enter your mind on Sunday night, August 20th, 1989? Yes. And how did it enter your mind that night? I thought he was going to kill me that night, and I thought he was going to have sex with me first. And did that flash to any previous thoughts you had had? <coughs> any what? Previous thoughts. Well, thoughts you had had earlier in well, your life. Well, was a thought. That's the whole question. Okay. When you were thinking that your father might have sex with you on the night of August 20th and kill you, okay, did that remind you of these earlier thoughts you had about not wanting to die in the middle of a sex act with your father? No, it didn't have to remind me. It was always in my head. It was always there. Well, was it there then, Mr. Menendez? Yes, it was there. Let's go back, if we can, to when you're living in New Jersey. Do you remember, let me strike that, did you have an opportunity in the last few months to look over your school records from the Princeton Day School? Yes. And did you read the comments that all your teachers had written about you over those years? Yes. And was there something that you remember experiencing as a school child at school related to what was happening at home? Certainly. What were you experiencing at school? And, I'm, and when I say related to happening at home, I mean to the sexual activity with your father. Do you understand that? Yes. And what would happen at school? I would lose my concentration um, and I would wander off. 
And were you aware of doing it at the time? Uh, sometimes I was aware when I snapped out of it. And what would be the thought or thoughts or pictures or images that would cause you to lose your concentration? Anything could cause me to lose my concentration. The way somebody looked at me reminded me of my father or you know, what somebody was wearing. If my father had been wearing that or a box, the way it was positioned, anything, didn't matter. But was it related to the sex with your father? Yes. And when you reviewed the school records, did you see things in those records that reminded you of these concentration problems? Well, it talked about it all over the school records. Back up a little. I Who saw talked about it? My teachers. What did they say? They, they said that I had a, a serious problem in concentrating during tests, during school class, school, and, and at any time that I wouldn't be able to concentrate very well, that I would get very nervous and anxious. Well, weren't you a pretty nervous, anxious person since the time you were a little boy? Yes, I was. Um, and did this sex with your father, you think, make you calmer and more relaxed? And more Definitely not. Just, it just, it didn't make me more nervous uh, for school. It just made me real paranoid. Paranoid of what? of giving myself away. And do you remember when you were living in New Jersey, uh, practicing tennis and playing in matches and having concentration problems? Yes. And were any of those concentration mm -hmm. problems related to, in your mind, in your memory, the sex with your father? Yes, that's what they related to. Do you remember hearing here uh, various teachers and coaches talking about you spacing out? Yes. Did you know when you were younger that you spaced out? Yes. And is that the same as the concentration problems, or is that different? That's what he was talking about. Mr. Menendez, in your family, who was in charge of the sports and who was in charge of the school as far as you were concerned, as far as your life was concerned? Well, my mom drove me every place in the sports, uh, but she definitely controlled the school. Okay, you have to back up because every other word now. She drove you to the sports, but who was in charge of deciding what the sports training would be, what sports you'd be involved in? My father. And in dealing, in talking about your mother, um, what was her involvement with your learning process? If you understand the question. Yeah, she would uh, basically train me in school. She trained you in the school? No, or? Ab about school work. Okay. Your mother was a school teacher once upon a time, wasn't she? Yes. Is that what she had wanted to be? No. Did she tell you what she had wanted to be? Yes. What had she wanted to be? She wanted to be something in communications, um, like a radio anchor or, or an anchor woman or something like that. Did she want to have a career in, in, in the entertainment industry? Yes. Did she ever talk about wanting to be an actress or a model or anything like that? Sometimes, but mostly she wanted to do, she was a very good speaker, and, uh, and so uh, that's what she wanted to do. Um, when she would train you in schoolwork, where would this take place? In the dining room. And you heard your brother describe uh, an incident that he observed, or incidents that he observed, where she would grab papers away from you and tear them up? Yes. Would she do that? Oh, yes. And what would make her do that as far as you knew? Me not getting a the right score on the test, she would sometimes time me or sometimes have me do handwriting tests. Usually timing or papers that I was going to turn into school. And if she didn't like the way I did them, she would sometimes just rip them up. Let's separate two things. Is there a difference between your mother training you in schoolwork with her own materials and tests that she'd give you and your homework that your teachers were assigning? Yes. Did she work with you on both? Yes. Let's focus on the homework first.
Okay. Mm -hmm. Did she supervise your homework? Yes. Did she on occasion do your homework? Yes. Did your father do your homework? Sometimes. The Spanish homework, for example. Yes. You heard Ms. Sharp testify that there was stuff being turned in that was very different than what was going on in class. Yes, he who would was do doing, this. Who was doing that? My father. And throughout your school career, and in reading those comments, uh, is it frequent that teachers have noticed that what was coming in from the home, essays particularly, was very different than your work on tests? Well, it wasn't my work, so um, I think they noticed. I think they even commented to me sometimes about, they would do it in a sarcastic way about, my, your work at home is, is so good. Too bad you can't do that in class. Now, was this by your choice that your parents were doing your work at home? No, my, my mother had a program set where I had to turn in all of my writing assignments to her the day before. And then she would do what? She would look at them, go over them, correct them, um, and tell me how to rewrite them. So she would change them. Is that right? Yes. And what, would you, what, what you would turn in would be whose work? My mom's. Only hers? Well, I would written the original paper, and then she had crossed out probably about half of it usually and then rewritten. Now if you, in working on these assignments with her, if you'd rewrite them and you gave it to her and she didn't think you did it right or it wasn't good enough, what would she do? Uh, she'd put me in the closet. She'd, she'd do that a lot more times than that though. We haven't gotten to the closet yet. What would she do with respect to the paper itself? She would rip it up and throw it in the air and say, you've got to do this over. This is terrible. You're never going to embarrass me like this and turn it in. Now, let's turn. Now, that would be on homework assignments, assignments from school. Ones that she thought were unrepairable. Let's turn to the training stuff, though. She gave you tests that, that she had, yes. she had obtained. Yeah, they were like SAT form tests. And were some of them reading comprehension type tests? Yes. And would she drill you in those tests? Yes, yeah, she had a stopwatch. And I would sit down and, and do the test. And sometimes she'd sit across from me. Sometimes she'd walk around me. Sometimes she'd go into the kitchen holding the watch. She'd hold it like this. And, uh, and I would have to do the reading test. And uh, what would happen at the end of the test? Well, she'd, she'd grade it. And I usually didn't do very well in those. And what would she say? She would tell me what a stupid kid I was and what a rotten job I had done, and uh, this was just about how bad I had done. Were there any experiences that you can remember where your mother was doing schoolwork with you that wasn't with her angry or critical? No. None? Well, she was doing schoolwork or time tests? No, she always got angry. Did she ever find the work that you did satisfactory or acceptable or good? Once in a while. Once in a while. I, I, I'd always have corrections, but once in a while I did it okay enough to, to pass in her eyes. But was she still critical? On the mistakes that I did, yes. Let me go back for a moment to... Um, something we touched on before. You've but now testified to a fair amount of the activities between yourself and your father concerning sex. Is that right? No. Well, you've testified about a lot of it, have you not? Never mind, I'll withdraw the question. Let's turn back to Friday before your parents were killed, okay? Yes. Did you tell your brother some of the details that you've told us here today? Yes. Particularly the stuff having to do with pain and stuff. Did you tell him that? Yes. What types of details do you remember, if you remember, telling Lyle about on Friday on the drive south? I told him about the, the oral massages. Um, I told him about the, the rough sex with the pins and the needles. Um, I don't know if I told him about the knife. Uh, I told him about the knife when he threatened it at my uh, throat. Just, no. I told him about a lot of the threats that Dad had told me. Okay. You said you don't know if you told him about the knife, and then you said you told him about the knife at your throat. What do you mean? 
the knife during the rough sex. The kitchen knife? Yes. The Rambo knife is not a kitchen knife? No. And why did you tell him those details out of all the details about your sexual activities with your father? Because I was trying to explain to him why Dad had reacted the way he did. I don't understand. What do you mean? Lyle was questioning me about when it started, how it, how it went on, and how it, how, what, what happened in it. Um, I, and I, I wanted to convey to him probably why Dad was so upset and, and, and so ready, for, willing for us to die rather than have this information released on Friday versus, versus not. And so I was just telling him some of the things that used to happen. Were you also trying to explain to him why you didn't or couldn't stop it? Well, I, I explained to that, but that wasn't partly, that wasn't due to the rough sex. Well, wasn't that due, however, to the threats and the fear? Yes. And wasn't rough sex scary? Yes, that was very scary. Were you trying to tell him the things that you thought were the weirdest? Yes. Your Honor, this would be a good place to uh, stop for the day. All right, we'll be in recess until tomorrow at 9 o'clock.